So Walker County Emergency Services is made up of 18 fire stations. Six of those, October 1st, will be career. Currently, there's four. Uh, we have we have roughly 50 career firefighters and around 50 volunteer fighters, firefighters, which we are recruiting heavily. Uh, so those of you that are interested, pick up one of my cards at the back. We'll get you an application, get you through the process to get you involved and help your community as a volunteer firefighter. We pay for retirement. You get uh, a small subsidy at the end of the year, average is about $1,500 to help you pay for your gas and your coverage for the wear and tear your vehicle. But we need help. Looking forward to you uh, applying. Help us out. So, a lot of people think that the fire department is just responding on structure fires. You hear a lot about just fire calls. But actually, we respond on a lot more than you think. We respond to medical calls, hazardous materials, uh, fire alarms, medical alarms, uh, medical type calls, gas leak, lift assist, technical rescues, just to name a few of the highlighted uh, response types that we have. And, you know, we are looking every day and evaluating every day how we can uh, approach those more efficiently for you, the citizens, and for our service delivery. We have a Bureau of Fire Prevention. They do fire investigations. They do fire inspections, public education. If you call, if you want to set up time for us to come teach a fire safety course at your church, at your school, uh, in your community, we'll be glad to do that. We have home, home fire safety. Uh, this is a this is a major portion of your of the new ISO rating, which is what sets your insurance premiums. Um, coming up, we're going to get evaluated anytime. I'm expecting a phone call any day uh, for an evaluation. All of our surrounding uh, municipalities and and county governments uh, are getting have been evaluated as of late. So there's a by having this bureau, it's been in place for a while. It's nothing new. We've been doing it. We are making some improvements to it. We're going to get out and start doing more fire inspections. Because again, through fire inspections, public education, we're going to save more lives and property through that than we ever will in a reactive response after the incident takes place. So we're looking forward to, to making that, uh, that progress and that commitment to, to doing a better job of that. But this is worth, this component of ISO is worth 5.5 bonus points, which I'll talk about a little bit more than that. So, Look, ISO, and again, if you're not familiar, the insurance service office is what your, your insurance companies look at the county ratings or the municipality, your community ratings, they call it, and it's on a scale of 1 to 10, and it, it's the components that make it up are the 911 center, the major components, 911 center, the fire department makes up the majority, and, and then your water authorities make up the other, the other uh, about 30% of the, of the rating. But your fire department makes up the majority. And what they're looking at, they're looking at the personnel that respond to the calls, not just how many you have, how many are active and respond. Your training records, what type of training you're doing, they are, there are guidelines that are set that we have to follow. We do fire hydrant testing and maintenance. Uh, obviously, we're working on improving our response times is one of the main things we'll talk about today. And then through our pre-incident plans, which are uh, when our firefighters go out and we evaluate your business uh, and the industry, we're looking at ways to make it safer, uh, not only for the occupants, but also the firefighters when they respond to the incident, uh, and how we can look at, again, the overall safety and well-being of everybody involved through our pre-incident plan. So just some numbers to show you. In our, our Walker County's evaluation for their last ISO evaluation was in 2011, was affected 2012. In the state of Georgia, at that time, there are 1,038 communities that are evaluated with ISO. Walker County's in the top 7%, top 7% were ISO class three. Now there are some areas of the county that are the three Y and then there are 10. If you live more than seven and a half miles, from a fire station, you're going to you don't you pay the top premium. You don't you do not. It's looked at as if you don't have coverage, and we do have a couple of small areas that have that, and we're looking at ways to improve that. Um, if you if you live within five miles of a fire station and you are within 1,000 feet of a fire hydrant, you get the ISO class three, which is where our primary rating where we are, and you can see that 56 only 56 out of 1,038 in the state of Georgia have achieved this. So. 
Uh, it's a it's a testimony of the the previous administration. What they what they did is when Randy Campbell was, was here. He's he's the big proponent of ISO, and he did a good job of getting you in a position to lower your insurance premiums. Let's look at the nationwide numbers. Forty seven thousand two hundred forty two nationwide communities are evaluated by ISO. Walker County, Georgia, is in the top five percent of the nation. Say it again, top five percent. 1,998 class three organizations or communities out of 47,242. So when you start looking at your public safety fee or your current fire fee, and you start comparing it to your premiums and what they would cost if this, if this number didn't exist and we were at a three, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to call your insurance company as I, as I did and you'll, you'll find out what exactly you're saving and getting a response. So 2016, Walker County Emergency Services ran round numbers, 3,500 calls. There were 2% of those were structure fires, 9% fire other, which are our brush fires and vehicle fires, uh, and then we ran 89% of other type of calls, medical, lift assist, trees down. Again, I say there every time, I think we're the tree down capital of the world. We go on trees down every day. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's rain the ground, saturated or falling, if it's dry, they're, they're snapping. Uh, we're extremely busy with that, but we're, we're, at, we're out there and we're trying to get clear the roadways up for you because we know there's a, a delayed response from the uh, county road department, especially after hours, and then DOT. So we're out there trying to, trying to make that difference for you. But we run, you know, close to 90% other calls, medical calls. We're, we are, our services are beyond what ISO looks at just as a structure fire. We are out there working for you every day. So as a fire chief, you know, I, I ask myself often, and those, those that are in the room that, that work with me get tired of hearing it, but I'm constantly referring to what is the greater good. And what I mean by that is doing what's right for the majority of being the citizens the majority of the time. Now, we're not perfect. We're not going to save every house. We're not going to save every life. But we are going to do our best to mitigate the situations as efficiently and effectively as we can and then run the operation uh, the same way. So when I got here in January, we started evaluating things, and we started looking at how we were responding. I started looking at the volunteer response and how, it's, how it consistently uh, lines up with the nationwide statistics on the decline of volunteers. You know, in 20 years ago, there was 1.2 million volunteers, and today it's somewhere around 550,000 in the nation. It's drastically falling off. The main thing we hear is that people don't have time, can't be committed to doing it. So as I look at these response times, they were our average response time was nearly 15 minutes. We were dispatching stations to calls, and if they didn't respond for 10 minutes, there was a certain type, it didn't matter what type of call, but if a uh, lift assist, if you will, for example, if nobody responded, they waited 10 minutes to dispatch again. So you or your family member, your mom, your dad, whoever, laid the floor and waited an extra 10 minutes. We stopped that. We're, you're now getting somebody responding immediately because we seen one of the career stations on the first call. So that's one thing that we changed. We started looking at, you know, we started asking the question, how can we improve response times? Can we, stay, can we keep the status quo and deliver a service, you know, for the greater good? And the answer was, was no. Now, we haven't hired any firefighters. We haven't bought any equipment. We're, we're making these changes with, with uh, apparatus and equipment and personnel that we have. And there have been people leave this meeting, these meetings and go out there and say we bought QRVs, the quick response vehicles that we went to. Never bought anything. But we start looking at these response times. The, the, the quick response vehicles are F4 and F550 chassis basically a brush truck that was bought 2003-2004, they average about 12,000, they have about 12,000 miles on them. That's all they have. Rarely been used. The pumpers, which is what you see here, or the, or the fire engine as most people will call it, this is a 2009 model. It's got 107,000 miles on it. Now, we're geographically challenged. We've got 460 square miles in Walker County, and we're running these big trucks to death on medical calls, lift assist, treating the roadway from the Fayetteville and I. 
over the mountain back, wearing them out. So it's not that the fire chief or the firefighters want to be in the QRVs for the safety fact of the two in, two out, working off of the engine. It's just that it is the greater good for Walker County at the current time. So we made a change. We went to the QRV response. This is what we're responding to 91 plus percent of our calls in now. Where in January, it was 100% out of the big trucks. So it's safer on the roadway, the big trucks. This truck gets two miles a gallon, two and a half miles a gallon. Fuel. Replacing tires are $1,000 a tire. We're wearing them out. We have one truck, it's, it's actually the shop now, although well, it's, it's a tandem axle. For the rear tires, it's $4,000. We're replacing them every other year. Doesn't make sense. So we're now in a QRV or a quick response vehicle. It carries 400 gallons of water, 50 gallons of foam, has extrication equipment on it, medical equipment. It is extremely versatile and, and a, we look at it as a multi-purpose unit. Here it is in comparison to this, that same truck. You can kind of see the difference of what, what, is, what is on and what is off the road right now. So as we looked at, we made that change and shortly thereafter, we started looking at how we could up staff or improve our staff in the response times. So we looked at our call volume. And there is no question that the majority of our call volume has always been on the north end of the county. It's where the population is. It's common sense. So we decided that the Flintstone station was our best option to renovate. Uh, it, it took a small portion of money to renovate station two. Uh, again, giving the internal maintenance Jack, and Jack Wallace credit for doing a great job at Station 2 and saving us a lot of money. But we, we moved firefighters over there in July 1st. We had 58 calls in two weeks, and 54 of those were handled with those QRVs. Previous, prior to July 1st, the average response time in that area when a career staff had to respond was 12 and a half minutes. We've reduced that to now less than six and a half minutes, but a six minute improvement. When you have irreversible brain death in four to six minutes, when a fire doubles in size every minute, you know, we, we know seconds count, but minute, minutes really count. So we've, we've cut that response. So it didn't take long to confirm the numbers and the data, and the, the, all, the, all the type of data and numbers we were extracting from existing uh, types of response times, call volume, uh, you know, call types. When we start looking at this, we made a huge impact on the north end of the county in, in a short period of time. We actually had a structure fire the first day, July 1st, and they kept it to a room of content, which would not have happened had we not been staffed in that area. So again, the greater good, as we start looking at how can we utilize current resources and not add to the budget and, and make a have a greater impact on the people in Walker County. We look at our new response model, our expansion model, and we're going to be staffing, effective October 1st, we're going to be staffing six career stations. Now keep in mind, we, we have 18 fire stations, it'll be 19 after we, we bring one up. So we have plenty of need for volunteers to help us out. And we'll reiterate that several times about this. But the stations, our average response time, give you some, give you some numbers on response times. I gave you the numbers to the north end that where we were responding from here in Chickamauga. And if you got the map, you're looking at the one with all the circles. These are five mile radiuses around the station. So as you look at the Chickamauga station was responding completely to the north end if the volunteers didn't, didn't respond. And it's over 50 something percent of the time the volunteers can't respond. Again, we're low in number, they're working a lot. A lot of them have two jobs. You know, and if you see one of our current volunteers and you shake their hand or hug their neck, tell them they appreciate them risking their life for you because they don't get they don't get a whole lot for doing it. They've been doing it. Most of them have been doing it 25 years. So uh, we don't have as many as we used to. But we're thankful for the ones we have. But we staff. We now we we currently staff Station Two, Station Six in Chickamauga, Station One in Rock Spring here on 27. We are bringing up on West. Highway 136, Alex Drive is our headquarters. We're bringing up the career staff at Station 20, which will uh, be able to get down 341, the backside of 193, down the cove, 
uh, Kensington area uh, a lot quicker than we are now, reducing those response times. But our, our biggest, our biggest and greatest challenge was Villanelle. You know, we got we have the mountain right here, so our average response time to Station 14 in Villanelle, big nice brand new station, was 25 minutes. It's nearly impossible for us to make an impact in 25 minutes. Now there's only two volunteers on that side of the mountain now. And they work, and they're busy. So what is the greater good? South of Lafayette, the Cane Creek Community Station 15, our average response time is 15 minutes. So again, the greater good, what can we do? We are, we are going to downsize the units to two firefighters, two career firefighters, minimum staffing per unit. Again, it's not the ideal situation. We want to have three firefighters, so we have a two in, two out mentality on structure fires. However, the majority of our calls, 91 plus percent, are handled out of that QRV. So again, what is the greater good? We're still going to get there on structure fires. We should get to them quicker now that we keep them in the kitchen and keep them to a room of content. We're going to transition to offensive transitional attacks, uh, blitz attacks, different types of strategy and tactics, tactics will change along with our training. So, but we know we're going to improve response times. We know that 91 plus percent of the time, we're going to be more efficient, more effective because we're going to get to you. We're going to cut these response times and build now from 25 minutes to eight, nine minutes. No question. About three miles inside the county line is a Whitfield County Station 6. I've talked to uh, the fire chief in Whitfield County. We're going to work on automatic aid group, but they staff two firefighters 24 hours a day as we will at 14. So that backup and that relationship is going to get strong to where the, our actual backup and theirs will be just miles down the road now instead of having to travel that 15, 20 minutes. So this is a, this is a, this is a huge impact and a huge improvement of what we're doing for the citizens in, in the county here as well. And then these response times to 15 and 16's territory south of Lafayette, uh, you know, they're going to improve to six and seven minutes for 15. So again, we think about the irreversible brain death, the cardiac arrest, the strokes, the type of calls, the structure fires that are in the content, or a kitchen fire when you leave something on the stove, which is the most common cause of a residential structure fire. We're going to get to them quicker and hopefully they'll make a very good impact to that. So again, just to recap on it, reduces response times, increases the opportunity to save life and property, uh, obviously saves on fuel and maintenance. Our community relations should get better because, you know, Walker County kind of had this, you know, I used to hear it and see it, and, you know, nobody wanted to, why are the firefighters out in the community? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? I want them to be in the community. You need to see what we're doing out there. I'm hoping when we're at the grocery store, we're talking to you, shaking your hand, asking you how your day is. Because that's what we should be doing. We want to be seen. We want you to call us. We want you to come, come see us. But we're, it makes ISO duties become more efficient. We're, at, we're not having to travel across the county to, to do the hiring inspections and to do different types of uh, work that we have to do to maintain that ISO rating. We're going to be in a, in a spread out and you know, covering a lot, a lot more area, more efficiently. And again, it improves our automatic aid. So those are some changes that we've made. We, we, we no doubt, we know that's going to be for the greater good. It's not, we're all, we're all, we're constantly, you know, I used to say, I used to sit back and be one of those that said, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. How many of you have said that? You know, but I, I, as I've matured and gotten older, I realize that's really not the best approach. You should always be evaluating how to make things better. Never be satisfied with the status quo the way it is because there, there's always things that need to improve and need to change. So we're, we're constantly working for you. We're constantly evaluating how we can make things better. So the public safety fee. This was a, another thing that I saw when I came in January just did not make sense to me was the current fire fee. And I, I didn't know that Commissioner Whitfield throughout his campaign, campaign was getting uh, – phone calls and comments and conversation about the, the fire fees, you know, just, they don't make a lot of sense, they're not fair. Well, I talked to him short, not long after I got here, probably a few, few weeks, maybe a month or a month and a half. And I asked him if we could reevaluate how we're, how we're doing this. It's not equitable to everybody. 
We have, we have people on an 800 square foot mobile home or a house paying the same as somebody that owns a 5,000 square foot house. It's not equitable. It doesn't make sense. The, the, majority, the majority of those in the smaller houses that it takes less resources to cover what we're doing, especially on fires, but we're paying the majority of the fee for the revenue. So one of the questions that you'll have is why is it based on square footage? Well, as a fire service is concerned and how we relate square footage is with needed fire flow. And needed fire flow is the amount of water in gallons per minute if your house or business was involved at 50%. How much would we need? And then it just trans transitions to the more water you need, the more resources you need. The number of firefighters, equipment, and all of it equates to hours worked. So I pulled a couple of responses that we had and I want to go over with you today to just to give you a comparison of what, what I'm talking about. So on your left in the example, there's a 900 square foot mobile home. It took eight firefighters, three engines, which were the bigger trucks you saw earlier, one tender, which is a big truck that carries more water. One command vehicle took less than two hours. This was a well-involved, 80% involved mobile home. Less than two hours. On your right, it's a 4,000 square foot house over a basement. It took 29 firefighters, 11 engines or tenders and tankers, three command vehicles, mutual aid assignments, and, and realize that uh, we have a mutual aid association and, and along with our automatic aid, when we have larger fires, we pull, when we deplete our resources, we pull other resources in from municipalities and county governments to either backfill our call volume and, uh, or, or actually come to the fire or the incident that we're, that we're on. So, you know, again, other communities are working for you also in good relationships and we always want to thank our mutual aid partners. The CERT team was there, which is another volunteer organization that we're proud of. Uh, the uh, CERT team came out on this particular call, set the bus up, they did great, had food for everybody to rehab, uh, and again, totally volunteer, uh, spending time away from their family to make it better for the first responders and the fire department, and any, actually anybody that walked up to the, to the incident. And it took eight hours. So when you start looking at time and money and, and and what it takes to, to look at what type of responses and then on these fires, what it takes. We, we came to, you know, the understanding that a, a square foot, based on square footage just makes sense. It's equitable for everybody. So we, you've got the sheet in front of you. I know there'll be questions. My card is on the table in the back. I've, we've, since we started these meetings, I've probably gotten, I don't know, 15, 20 phone calls, and they all end with a better understanding because it's a little confusing. Uh, you know, we can't, we're not going to be able to get it spelled out exactly. You know, I can, I read it, it makes sense to me, but I'm one of the ones that put it on paper. So uh, I know it's not going to be the same for everybody, so I want you to call and ask questions. I'll meet with you. We can go over this. Uh, we, we communicate with the tax assessor's office to make sure that we're on the same page with everything. Uh, if you have questions about your, your square footage, about it. Um, so let me go over now as we've got a commissioner get up here and, and get, to, get to his part. But let's pretend the fire department doesn't exist. What if we didn't exist? Because I have people come up to me and say stuff all the time. Hey, hey Chief, I don't, why am I paying this? I've never used the fire department, ever. Never. Don't plan on it. Never going to use them. You can't get to my house anyway. What you don't realize is that we're working for you every day through that ISO rating and through your insurance premiums. And again, remember, top five in the country, top five percent of the country, ISO class three. So what if we didn't exist? So I called my insurance company personally. I said, hey, hey, if, if I was, if I was, I didn't have a rating at all. What would my insurance? What would my homeowner's insurance? go up to. So a couple hours later, my insurance agent calls me back. She said, you don't want to know. I said, well, I actually do want to know. That's why I asked. But, you know. but uh, she said, $1,500 increase. Increase. Above what I'm paying now. It didn't exist. Now, I'm one of those that are more than 1,000 feet. I'm 1,200 feet from a fire hydrant. I pay an extra 500 anyway because I don't have a fire hydrant close enough. So but when you start looking at 
when I start looking at my numbers and then I start pulling some nationwide numbers and you know it's not going to be a perfect perfect scenario or the perfect uh, numerical value here but when you start pulling it down to about a thousand dollars I called other insurance agencies or agents and I asked them and they said you could probably figure on a thousand dollars on a residential home with an increase not your total insurance but an increase in your premium a thousand dollars so when you start looking at 22,000 round number rooftops between mobile homes and, and residential houses in Walker County, Georgia, that's $22 million that you would be paying as a group. Not counting the businesses, that's another, that's <coughs> millions more. But just in your residential, what, you, what you'd be paying would be 10 times the amount you're paying now. So you look at a fire, a public safety fee that we're looking at, you know, the revenue is going to be billable at 3.9 round numbers, um, and then whatever is collected under that, because it'll be somewhere around hopefully 96, 97 percent collection. You know, with the with the 20 something million dollar premium increase, and then you don't get a response at all. Or you can look at it what, with what we're doing and what service delivery we're improving and what we give you now with ISO rating. The premiums are as low as anybody's around us. Catoosa County next door, everybody likes to compare us to Catoosa. So let's talk about Catoosa, they're ISO 5. They're 160 square miles, they have, with counting the city of Fort Oglethorpe, they have, uh, I think it's six out of nine stations total that are staffed, three firefighters, 24-7, 365. They cover the county well, do a good job. Glad they're there because we use them a lot. But they're, I, they're ISO 5. The premiums are higher. Gordon County is a six. Whitfield County just got evaluated. They're going to improve theirs. Uh, they've, they've put a they put a lot of money in the fire department since they hired Chief O'Brien the last couple of years. Trying to get that ISO rating better so they can get keep and then get the business. When these big businesses come in, they're looking at ISO ratings. I promise you, that's what they're looking at. That is one of the out of commissioners at top three. Top five, I know. Top five. Top five. So uh, it's important that we're here. We want to be here. We want to not only be here, we want to be here for you. We want to do a better job than we're doing. We want to do a better job tomorrow than we're doing today. And that's what we're going to constantly look at and how we approach things. And I know I, I don't like increases. Nobody does. We, we, we all, you know, but keep in mind that your neighbors as a community, that 10,000 properties, parcels, if you want to look at it that way, are going down. We're getting a reduction. Now, there are 11,000 plus that are getting increased, but there are 10,000 that are going down and getting a reduction. So it's equitable, uh, but I'd be glad to talk about it more in depth with you. Uh, again, my, you can call me at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'll talk to you. My phone's always on. If I don't answer, I'll, I'll get the message. I'll call you back. So I'll take some questions. And then we'll get Commissioner Whitfield up here. Yes, sir. Nagaria uh, is, is here about the square uh, footage pay. Can you need to talk to us a little bit about what you're trying to charge the poultry producer? I didn't hear the last part. The poultry. What, how much okay, poultry? Yes. Okay, so if you're zoned agriculture and your classification is, is agriculture, uh, then, then you're going to be charged. What we're doing is charging for the if you have a house on the property. All right. Most most people have their houses on a separate piece of property because they have to build a house. You have that finance to the bank. Okay. You can't get that in a chicken house. If you have a chicken house, then the property basically you have to save money. Okay. So if you each parcel is charged separately, each parcel is charged separately. So if you had chicken houses on one parcel, they're going to exceed unless you I don't know what size you have, but I'm just if you have more than one. Okay, so you exceed the 4,000 the four thousand square foot maximum on the agriculture. So that, that parcel will be $400 total. For 30 for, for 20. You max out at $400. One fee, $400, maxed out, everything added together, square footage. So your house would be another If your house, if, if the house was with that parcel, Without it, your house is separate. Your house is your house is separate, and that's how it is currently. Yes. 
Commercial property, commercial property has a different maximum, but it's the same way. So if you had, a, you, I don't know how many you've got, I'm guessing you've got six or seven, five buildings down there, yeah. something like that. Combined square footage at the, at the maximum, and I think commercial is $3,000 yeah. per, per parcel. So I don't know how it's set up. If all, if all your buildings are on one parcel, then it would max out, max out at $3,000. Through the through the needed fire flow, and then what the budget requires. And again, we didn't go up on the budget. Let me say this because we didn't cover this yet. But the public safety fee now includes the two hundred fifty thousand dollars subsidy for the EMS contract with Puckett, which is what we the county pays Puckett under contract for the ambulance service. The emergency management portion, which is 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 basically my salary, and the reason it's in there separate is because we get a, a pretty big grant from the state of Georgia and GEMA and it has to show under that line item that it's separate. So we're actually saving money to about, about $23,000 a year just by having that in line. So it's not even as, if you look at it that way, that one's not as much as, as it looks. But. And then the fire department's 3.4 million. And the fire department's been, they've been trying to get it out. I think it was actually put in a letter form that they were trying to get the budget to 3 million, which is impossible. Um, so they were coming out of general fund, three or $400,000. So now everything is coming out of Public safety fee. Nothing's going to be pulled from the general fund. So overall, it is it is an increase, but it kept the it kept the, it's going to keep the general fund from having to fund the public safety fee. Yes, sir. We have uh, greenhouse. How are you going to count those? Are those going to be square footage wise? I mean, they're not they're permanent structure frame wise, but they're covered in plastic. Is that considered a Kwanzaa hut? No, it's not. Kwanzaa huts are dead on their permanent structure. Uh, Okay. Then it's not considered. There, there are five cat. There are five building types or structure types, which is the uh, for the agriculture, uh, which is kind of the biggest question that we have. I think you guys are getting that mostly, but it's a barn, uh, milking, milking house or parlor, poultry house, stable, or the Kwanzaa type. Uh, I call them huts, but buildings. If it's if it's the shed, pole barn, and and. They're confirming that what you're talking about would be a shed, but that does not count. It has to have walls, it has to be, and that's on the agriculture. That's not residential. The residential is just the homes. If, you're, if your use or your, uh, you know, because it, it could be zoned, could be zoned agriculture, but the, the actual classification would be residential. So that's what they're looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, we all appreciate what the Department of Agriculture does. It's, it's an even public work but it's not exempt from waste. If we, in our personal operations, if we uh, are involved in waste, we bear the expense. We don't get to force our neighbors to carry that expense. I don't know how many accidents, times I've seen out on the road, a fender bender, and this big fire truck you're talking about, yes, sir. was going to it, and there was already a smaller truck there on, in Route 2, as well as the county law enforcement. That's a waste. That big truck going to a car accident is a waste. And it also keeping up. We don't want to, we don't want to put, a, put a price on the value of life, but ridiculous is ridiculous. Well, and, and ridiculous has ridiculous has limits because it depends on how that call is dispatched. So what you see, the perception you have, may or may not be true. So I'm not disagreeing with you, and that's why we're taking the big trucks off 90 percent of the calls. But sometimes, if it's, if it's knocked out or toned out, we get it's toned out as a, as a vehicle accident with entrapment, we're sending two trucks. And that could be the big truck or two little trucks or whatever. So it may or may, it may, we get there and then we say, oh, it's a fender bender, and we turn around and go back. Now that may not be what happened, but that does happen. So don't let the perception always be the reality in some of these cases. But you can always call me and I'll look it up for you. You need to check for other vendors for your tire supply as well. We do. We do. We now, I don't know if they did, but we do now. You was talking about the big trucks, and you're spot on, and that's one of the major changes because up until Chief Hodge got on board with us, 100% of the calls got a big truck. Or two. Or two. Now, less than 10% of the calls get a big truck. Yes, sir. 
If you're, if you're talking about the current budget and the previous, then yes, the general fund was having to supplement the fire department. Okay. Um, my question is, are these fees going to be on top of the taxes for I'm going to let the commissioner answer that, but I believe it would be separate. What everybody has on their bill currently is a fire fee that's for residential is $130 a year. That fee entitled will be going away and replaced with a public safety fee based off this new schedule. You'll still have your property tax from the county, the school system, and if you live inside the city limits, you could have a city tax. But this is replacing an existing tax that's more equitable, so it's based off a minimum and a maximum, or primarily driven by square footage, where before the fee was based off of pulling a number out of the air. $130 fee on residential across the board. So if you have a residence that's 1,300 square feet or smaller, you just got a reduction on this fee. If you have a structure or residence greater than 1,301 square feet, you've got an increase. And it's about a, almost a 50-50 split. There's about 10,000 residents that's getting a decrease of some sort down to as low as $90. But there's 11,000 that's going to take an increase with a maximum of $400 on the residential side. Thank you. Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you do? The public house catches on fire. Are you already moving around to do that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're responding to every call. Okay. We're, not, we're not stopping. Matter of fact, we're going to be responding to more because there's, there are some skewed. Uh, uh, policies in the dispatch center where we weren't responding to enough of the critical medical calls, so we're actually going to more. Yes? So uh, the taxes are overall going up, and the public service, like insurance, has gone down, so we're going to pay more for the public service to have less insurance? Now, it, it's, it should have been the same. It's been a three for a while. So did they Several take, years. Take away the insurance payment covers for all the Oh. oh, the health insurance? Yeah. So we're going to pay more for them to have less benefits? I mean, if we are, it should go all the way to the top. It should be everybody. Well, what we had to do last year, talking about the health care benefits for the county employees, uh, we were facing a $4 million increase in health care costs. We were only paying $3.5 million. We we're going to go up $4 more million. So just to cover the health insurance, we would have had to raise your millage about three and a half mils just to cover that insurance. So we made the hard decision to have to drop the dependent spouses off of the coverage. We were able to leave the children, leave the employees. But the way I looked at that decision, my first responsibility is to you as a taxpayer. My second responsibility is to the employees of the county. Their spouses come a little lower in the pecking order. So yeah, I could have sat back and just said, hey, we're going to keep the health insurance for all the spouses, many of which work a job, many of which could get health insurance through their own job. Or I could have raised your taxes three and a half meals just to cover health insurance of something that 98% of you sitting in this room would have got no benefit out of, but the spouses would have had coverage on your nickel. I think the way it works Yeah, there, there are some different formulations of that, but we were in a position financially, we had to take a, a full sweep at it and eliminate all spouses, whether regardless of age, regardless of employment, of status of the spouse, and regardless of male or female. Yes. Okay, me personally? Yeah, it hurts. The attitude of our cops, the 
see that the bank partner get good tops in. Oh, it, 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 it does create a challenge. I mean, it, it take, it's a challenge on all the departments. So the fire department struggles with recruiting. I know the sheriff's department does, and a lot of that is due to being competitive with salary, pay, and all benefits, not just health, but all benefits combined. And so, if the, you know, if the citizens want us to work on that, we can make that happen with your money very easily. Not a problem. Yes, sir. Yes, they will. These go in effect October 1st. It will be on this year's tax bill. And the changes in the additional full-time station coverages will start at 7 a.m. on October the 1st as well. Yes, sir. It's only one parcel. One parcel, but I do not have a home on that $400. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do all insurance companies go by the ISO rate? Yes. As far as I know, yes. Yeah, as far as we know, they do. In Georgia, yes. Yes, ma'am, over here. Yeah, we still got a lot to cover. Best is yet to come. I know some of you may have other commitments, but there's a lot you're going to miss. Yes, ma'am, over here. Yeah, I understand. I know some people got other commitments, but uh, we still got a lot to cover for those that can stay. I, I think it was something over here, maybe. Yes, ma'am. We, we did, we dropped to a minimum, and now we're going back to it. Yeah, cur currently, currently, you know, when we had the ambulance service under the fire department, and this was before I got here, there was advanced life support, first responder. We still first respond. We still have uh, multiple things that we can do, but we are going to get back to where the EMTs and paramedics can can actually use their skills at a higher level to give medications and have and interventions that that we work on our medical director to do. So, to answer your questions. Yes, it's coming back. Now, every every firefighter here on the career side that you guarantee the response is medically trained, and and the majority to at least the EMT certification through the state. And we're going to approve that because it's now a requirement upon employment. They have so much time to get it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right right on your uh, ISO rating, is it? Uh, me. Is it the lower number, the better the rating? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. How is uh, this new uh, fee going to affect, affect uh, government, uh, uh, government facilities uh, uh, and uh, the courthouse, stuff like that, and how it affects churches? Uh, currently, churches are exempt of this fee, and then obviously all government buildings are because it's part of our budget, part of our system. But one thing we are doing is we're going through and doing a uh, inspection of all of the government buildings to start with. We're finding a lot of public safety issues issues with fire hydrants not being checked and updated that are 10 years plus old that have not been checked. So we're finding a lot of things in our own housekeeping that we're addressing. Once we get our own house in order, then we're going to launch a program where these guys will go out and start doing uh, safety inspections at businesses to make sure they can help prevent fires and also in the churches and things to give a higher level of service even over above what we're doing. But we got to get our own house in order first. <coughs> Yes, sir, Greg. Uh, <coughs> as far as the churches go, do you guys hold them to a higher standard, say sprinkler systems? Uh, is there an inspection done to them if they're not paying the fee? 
We have a lot of old churches that are not. If anything, anything that's built now, or I guess as of a few years ago, Chief Linder, you might can answer this better, but the churches that were built in the county or additions built to the churches are required to have a sprinkler system. Well, can you force an upgrade if it's not a sprinkler system? Can you force an upgrade, fire extinguishers, that kind of thing in the kitchen areas? I mean, to all when we, some of these Yes, sir. When we start the inspection program, hopefully in January, to all the businesses, it includes the churches that have an occupancy load of over 500 people, they're state inspected. So they would be under that now, but we want to get that out to everybody through our, when we start our inspection program, because right now we're just, in our inspection program, we're doing the state inspections with, for this, for and with the state. So, so we're looking to improve that. So to answer your question, yes, in the future it's coming for all, but those that have an occupancy load of 500 or more get inspected now. Okay, yes, sir, over here. guess would be currently if you bought it at two separate times unless you have got one at the same time as two separate lots. Okay, but if it's two separate partials on the tax maps and at the assessor's office, that would be two separate partials. And so if you've got structures on each one of those partials, they would stand independently of each other. So but if there's no structure, there's no fee. If you've got just empty land or vacant land or woodland or timberland that there's no structure on, then there's no fee for the public safety. Okay, there, there is structures on it. And, uh, but what you can do, you can get Chief Hodges' card and he can actually pull your particular partial up and talk with you or any of you one on one and get into the details of your exact circumstances and help you with that. Yes. yes. Being told yes. Okay. And then each building will be set tax separately. If it meets one of those five I talked about. I'm sorry. If it meets one of those five building types that I talked about, up to the maximum. Total max. So it's all added. If it's on one parcel and it's five buildings that meet that meet those building types, then it's then it's it's a cumulative of everything and then maxed out at $400. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go move forward. I appreciate all the great questions. And if you sit here and have some more once we get through this, we'll open up the floor after I go through about 10 slides here to everybody. If you've got more public safety fire type related questions, we'll answer those as well. But let's, let's move forward. What we're going to do here, I'm going to show you two or three slides that we're going to start from the audit of our end of our fiscal year. These first two or three slides are a little bit wordy, but it's very important. There's going to be some key terms in here that I want you to take and remember because this will help you if you ever look at any other governmental audit. They all work and apply these terms the same, but I wanted to kind of give you a basis about the end of our fiscal year and the audit that was just released on July the 20th, where the county is as of September 30th at year end, where we stand financially and how that affects all of us in this county. So again, this is a little wordy, I know. It says, the assets and deferred outflow of resources of Walker County exceeded its liabilities and deferred inflow of resources at September 30th, 2016 by $60,313,769. Key word here is net position. You want to remember this word, write this term down. You never ever want to forget the wording or, or phrase net position. A decrease of $6,727,174 for the prior year before the effects of the blending of the Walk County Development Authority. If the net position, $67,543,994 is restricted. So that means there's 67 million of this is restricted, which means very limited or it's a fixed asset or something. 
as to what the funds may be expended for, the remaining deficit balance, so deficit means negative, the deficit balance of $7,543,994 is what's available to meet the ongoing obligations of the citizens and creditors of Walker County. So this is the key phrase I want you to remember. Write this down. We've got a negative balance at the end of the at the, at the end of the fiscal year of a negative seven and a half million dollars to pay our bills with. So what that's telling us is we are upside down in big time. This doesn't count the seventy million dollars worth of debt we've got. This is how much money and how big of a shovel we've got to start paying our debt with and also the ongoing daily operations of payroll and expenses to run the county was in a negative position. So that's why when I took office January the 1st, by January the 2nd, I'm asking the Comptroller, how much money do we have in the bank? He said, I knew you were going to ask me. I've already looked. We've got about $800,000 cash in the general fund today. Well, I knew that was a problem because I knew our payroll was over a million dollars a month. So property taxes just came in. Everything pretty much that was collected went right back out the door to pay other bills. So not only are we in a negative net position, we've got $800,000 cash million dollar payroll for the month and then we find out we got a stack of bills on the corner of my desk that exceeded three and a half million dollars of bills that had not been paid. So that's why the second week of January I had to go to the Bank of Lafayette and show them a cash flow projection for 12 months that showed the needed money that we needed to borrow just to stay afloat to pay the utilities, to pay the insurance, to pay the employees, we were going to need $8 million between January and December. So we were going asking for what's called a tax anticipation note. It's a legal term, tax anticipation note. Or they do an acronym, call it a TAN. We were trying to get an $8 million TAN to stay afloat. This right here is another statement that you can find on page 8 of the audit. The audit's available on the website free of charge. It's about 110 pages. You can send a PDF and pull it up and download it look at it. Here's another statement. The statement of net position and the statement of activities report the county's net position and change in net position. One can think of the county's net position as the difference between the assets and deferred outflow of resources and the liabilities as deferred inflow resources is one way to measure the county's financial health or financial position. Over time, increase or decrease in the county's net position are one indicator of whether its financial health is improving or deteriorating. However, other non-financial factors will need to be considered such as changes in the county's property tax base and the conditions of the county roads to assess the overall health of the county. How many of you in this room have ever looked at the county's financial audit ever? Raise your hand, please. About five of you, six of you. Don't feel bad. Up until 2015, I'd never looked either. I was as guilty as everybody else sitting here, probably the biggest guilt. Because I have an understanding and accounting background and I can go through that 110 page audit and get a real grasp real quick of where we are. And so I did an open records request back mid-year of 2015 and got, or 2016, excuse me, and got the 14 to 15 year audit. And folks, I was sick to my stomach to the point I had to put it down. I thought I was literally going to throw up of how bad our county was. And all this time I thought everything was okay. Because here's the way the previous administration did things. If they don't raise your taxes, and they tell you on the media how low your taxes are, and that we're the lowest in the state, or the third lowest in the state, or whatever that moving target is, if we don't raise your taxes, we don't wake you up. So how many of you would have been here today if there hadn't been for a tax increase? How many would have just come anyway? Public meeting, we're going to come anyway. Saw about six hands go up. 
Most of you are here because you have an understanding that your taxes are going up. You want to know more about it. Well, how many of y'all have ever been to one of the commissioner's public meetings over the last 16 and a half years? How many of you have been to a public meeting? Okay, about half of you. That's good. That's better. We were scared. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, that's a good point. He's scared to go because of the wrath. But I was guilty too. I didn't go either. I didn't look. I didn't go. Same thing with our cities. Until I got on the city council, I'd probably not been to more than three meetings. All right, here is another part of the audit. We've got just a couple more slides here on the audit, and we're going to move forward. And I don't like a lot of times the way these auditors have to word things because you. Us as a common everyday person, we don't do this every day. When we read this, we don't always understand what we're reading or what it really, really tells us. So when it says counties business type activities, that's a fancy way of saying your landfill and mountain co farms. Now why did they just say that? They could say business type activities such as, you know, they could have told us. Is operating expenses exceeding operations by a million thirty-four thousand eighty-six dollars. Revenues were insufficient to recoup the cost largely due to high depreciation expense and post-closure cost. Average citizens does not really understand what depreciation expense is or what post-closure is, or they may understand one or the other, but typically not both. And cost and closure and operating losses. A transfer from the general fund was made to cover most of the losses. This is on page uh, Roman numeral 6 of the audit, word for word. Now I'm going to show you in layman's terms how I explain this statement right here. And if I was going to write this report for you to understand it, for me to understand it, here's the way I would write this. At the county landfill and Mountain Cove Farms, we spent more than we took in by $1,034,086. Sales were insufficient to cover the overspending of having too many employees and all other expenses were out of control due to the bad management and no budget. Operational losses were mostly due to letting out-of-state companies have a key to the gate and charging them a reduced rate during the day. A transfer from the general fund, your property tax money, was made to cover most of the losses, but some of the bills didn't get paid here either because there wasn't enough money. So what was happening is we had out-of-state companies bringing tractor trailer loads of garbage multiple times a day. There's one company bringing us about eight truck loads a day of C and D, construction demolition waste. They were getting a discounted rate lower than any of us could go get on our own because they had volume. They had so much volume they needed the combination to the gate. So they could go in 24-7. Now how many do you think every load that went over to that landfill in the middle of the night or on the weekend got billed? Who knows? So when we decided we were going to change the locks on the gate, we wasn't going to open until about 7.30 in the morning, they had a fit. And when they found out we were going up on the rates, they really had a fit, come to one of my meetings and pretty well had a little meltdown, and said, you can't survive without us. If you don't work with us, there's four companies, we're all pulling together. It felt like I was fighting the union at the landfill. We're all pulling together. You cannot survive without us. You will go out of business at that landfill if you don't work with us. We're willing to pay you an extra dollar a ton. I said, no, you're going to pay us. You're going to go from $19.50 to $30 a ton. They said, no, we're not. We'll take our business elsewhere. I said, you will not survive without us. I said, look, I'm a numbers guy. I've done the math. We can live without you. The landfill had lost between a half a million and $650,000 every year consistently for 16 years. June of this year was the first month the landfill has made money in over 16 and a half years. And those four customers we divorced. I've got broke this up into three slides to see page one. These are all of our current assets. 
all of our cash receivables, inventory, equipment, $129 million in assets. This is the real screen here. You need to remember this one. This is the liabilities. This is everything that we owe. These are all the payables, the notes, tax anticipation, uh, bond, capital leases, landfill post closure, less than one year, same thing, left more than a year. $69,925,772. Almost $70 million. I said all through the campaign, because I was having a hard time getting data, that our debt was somewhere between 70 and 80 million dollars. The prior administration said there was no way it was impossible, it wasn't more than about 10 million. Talk about net position again, it's still the continuation of the balance sheets. You see up here at the top, total liabilities at 69, almost 70 million. So this is just the bottom half of the page. If you look right here, net position, unrestricted, Shows it's a deficit if it's in captions, means negative. Seven million five hundred forty-three thousand nine hundred ninety-four dollars is our bottom line net position number. For those of you that are in business, you have a business accounting system because governmental's different. It's what they call like your retained earnings, or how much capital you've got available in your business. How much how much money have you got to work with? We're in negative seven and a half million. So even if you don't know anything about accounting, on any governmental audit, all of them should be available online. You can pull them up and go to page one. It's required by law on page one, numeric one, not Roman numeral. They'll have a lot of Roman numeral stuff in front of it. Go to page one of an audit. Go to net position. Go to unrestricted and see what that number is. That'll give you a real strong indication if your government is healthy. All right, so let's look at a little history here. This is 2016-2015. We'll do a little comparison here. This is also a page right out of the audit. It shows general government. This is the business type activities, which is the landfill and the Mount Co. Farms. And this is the total. The audit that I looked at that made me sick I mean, to the point I thought I physically was going to be sick. Showed the net position at a negative $3,422,138. I thought it was bad then, folks. In one year, under the prior administration, we went from $3.4 million negative to $7.5 million negative. One year. Just think if they'd have still been here. Where would we be in another year or two? Because they wasn't going to raise taxes. They just go find somewhere else to borrow money. And I'll tell you about it. Continue to drive this thing off the cliff. We could have been 80, 90, 100 million. Because, folks, here's the thing. Here's why lenders keep loaning us money. The primary reason why they kept loaning them money is there's a couple of unique things about the state of Georgia that you need to remember. Number one, is we're one of two states in the entire country that it's illegal for a government to file bankruptcy. It's against state law. Now, I've been taking some criticism on Facebook by saying, well, this commissioner needs to quit lying to us. Commissioner, because the commissioner, he can bankrupt. And he should file bankruptcy and solve all of our problems because there's a little county over in Alabama called Walker County, Alabama, that owes about $25 million, and they're considering filing bankruptcy. It's an option for them. They can file it, what's called a Chapter 9, which is what governments file for bankruptcy. It's a Chapter 9 bankruptcy to reorganize. We've got $70 million. It's against the law for me to do it. I'm here to tell you, if I had that button or had that lever, I'd have already pulled it because it would allow us to use the court system to restructure some of our debt. Even if we file bankruptcy, even if it's legal to do, even when they do it in Alabama, it doesn't forgive the debts like when you file a Chapter 7 personal bankruptcy and you get all your debts blown away. It doesn't forgive the debts. 
the debts are still there. It just gives you an opportunity to reorganize, refinance, restructure. It basically gives you the option to increase your cash flow by usually kicking the can further down the road by refinancing stuff and extending your payments and lowering your payments. So our net position increasingly got worse. So let's go back just a few years. Let's look at 2009, 2010. 2009, we had a positive 9.4 million. 2010, we had a positive 15 million. From 2011 forward, they went on a spending spree. They went crazy. They weren't staying in their budgets. We were buying farms. We was having Guy Penrod come sing Merry Christmas to us. We were having fairs and carnivals. We were having a good time building industrial parks. We were doing a lot of stuff, folks. But the expenses were exceeding the revenue big time. We're going to tell you, you got the lowest taxes in the state. You can have the lowest taxes in the state, but we probably per capita have some of the highest debt per capita, per person in the state. So again, just the same slide again, 2016, remember net position, I can't say it enough, seven and a half million negative. Okay, in the past, here's what you would see as a budget. Under the general fund, there's 70 different department breakouts on the general fund. They would list them out for you. And you would see, like, governmental body, $657,907. That's how much information you'd get about the general or the governing body. Elections, 403580 So when you'd go to their public meeting to talk about any changes, look at the budget, this is the first page of three and a half pages that you would see. And this is what the department head saw. This is what the other elected officials saw. This is... How much detail you got? You've got no idea of what last year looked like. You got no idea what year to date looks like. But by law, they're required to put out a fund for the or a budget for the general fund. Here again, you see the uh, account, the accounting department numbers, all the different breakouts. Get to the end. Say, all right, general fund expenditures: twenty-three million one hundred nineteen thousand eight hundred eighty-two. She would sit there and read that line to line, make you feel good, and say, folks, we got a balanced budget. And they didn't do anything with it. They just did as they pleased. So here's what's changing. Here's 2018 going forward. You will now get access to document like this. We don't have this finished, so we've not released it, but I'm going to show you some screenshots. We're going to talk about it. This budget. This, this one printout right here is like 74 pages. This is what you'll start seeing. We're trying to set the new standard in Walker County government for budgeting and accountability. Okay, so when you come to these meetings in the future, if any f future commissioner bodies stands up in front of you and doesn't show you something like this, you need to raise cash. You need to say, we're not going back to this. This don't tell us anything. If Commissioner Whitfield can pull this up, why can't you? Don't you have the same computer software? Because what this will show you, and I know this is hard for you to see, this shows 2003 actual revenue and expenses. 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017 year to date, 2017 projected to, you know, what the projected the year is going to be. The 2018 request per department, per line item. So every department, elected official, every department, head, everybody is having to turn in a budget request. You're going to see what they're spending, what their revenues are compared all the way back to 2013. You're going to get the full view because we have to hold government accountable. A lot of people say, quit putting the burden on the property tax owners. We're tired of carrying the load. Well, you're really only carrying about 50% of the load. And I'll show you. This first line item here says real property. This is your actual residential property. 
$10.5 million on that top line. That's a big number. It is the biggest number in the, in the list. But just in other general fund revenues of other different types of property, would it be uh, mobile homes, vehicles, franchise taxes, sales taxes, alcohol, excise taxes, insurance premium, financial institution taxes, taxes and penalties and interest, totals almost $20 million. Their actual real property is $10.5 million. Motor vehicle is $842,000. This is just one section. This is just under taxes. You've got a whole other, these are service charges, court calls, fees, uh, all different types of revenue. It's another 830000 Here's another line of clerk of the court, bond fees, judicial, uh, all kind of jail type stuff. It's another million three. So when you get down here to the bottom, total revenues after rental income and royalty is just shy of $23 million. So the actual top line personal property is around 10 million, 10 and a half million. This is 22, almost 23 million. So there's a lot of different revenue streams other than just your property tax. But you've never seen this before. All right, now we're looking at expenses. For example, this is the governing body. The governing body is my office, my, the commissioner's office itself. And what you'll be able to see, every department, you'll be able to see the wages. Vacation pay, holiday pay, uh, health care expense, Social Security, Medicare, retirement, unemployment insurance, workers comp. You'll be able to see all of that under personnel. Where before, remember, you got one total number, all in. Now you're going to start seeing everything. And you've got operations, supplies, natural gas, water, sewer, electric, any type of books. And you got capital outlay, like we have to buy assets, new computers, equipment, those type of things that come under capital outlay. But again, 13, 14, so forth, if you look at total expenses, you look at 2016, last year. Out of that one department, they spent $902,000. My budget request for 2018 is 517000 not quite half, but pretty close. Just one department. Okay, this here is uh, talking talk about other financing. Okay, here we go. Missed this. One. These are this is the bills that we're paying in debt and lease payments and notes and bonds. List all of our bonds and our lease and all the interest. You've never seen this before. Right here is the request for 2018 from the accounting department. They're saying we're going to need almost $1.8 million a year to make our bond and lease payments and our note payments. This does not include the $4,385,000 for the splash tax. It's $4,385,000. That's uh, over 4.3 million. I don't remember the exact number. Okay, so we're paying out almost 2 million here. The splice is over 4 million. <clears throat> and we've got transfers to other departments. This is where they would take and transfer money out to other departments to make them balance. So you'll see here, going forward, interfund transfer out to the fire department. Going forward, it's going to be zero. So when you look down here at the bottom, you got less than you got twenty-two million seven hundred thirty-six thousand dollars in revenue total. You got twenty-six million nine hundred seventy-five thousand dollar in budget requests from all the departments and elected officials. We got four point two million dollars more in requests for spending than we've got money, and that includes your tax increase by two meals. And we still have got to shave and cut this budget by over $4 million. We've got a lot of work to do. If you look here, the past years, a good comparison to look at is 2015. They had $24 million in revenue. 
They spent $30 million. They overspent by $6.1 million. Do any of y'all know that? Nope, nobody told us that. Prior year, they spent two and a half too much, 2.8 the year before. 2016 is a little deceiving because they show a large revenue of $33 million. Well, that's where they sold this building here that you're sitting in today. This building was debt free. It's not anymore. It's leveraged. It's got to lean against it. The ag building next door, Mountain Co Farm, all of that got leveraged and put into a bond for $15.3 million to finish your industrial park. Because they said it's our future. That's what we kept being told. Industrial Park's your future. So we're going to do whatever it takes to get that thing finished. The thing about the Industrial Park, you look at it this way, and you see a beautiful manufacturing building of audio. It looks great. Fantastic company. If you turn this way about 90 degrees, you're back out to the farm. But it's our future. So, this negative $4.2 million dollars it's got all of the payments in it except for one. This has zero dollars, not one dollar, for Erlanger Medical Center for the $8.7 million that we owe them. And it's been litigated, it's been through the appeals courts a couple of times. The federal courts keep coming back telling us the same thing. Citizens of Walker County, you owe Erlanger the money. Now, I have met with the CEO of Erlanger personally face-to-face -face across the table three times already in eight months. And they've told me verbally, and they've told me in writing, we're going to get our money. And so we need to work out a payment plan, or we're going to take enforcement actions. And there's another court date coming up where they're going to go back to the federal courts and it's going to force the court's hand if we don't have something settled to give me a federal court order to raise your taxes probably more. Because in that original document, it states in there that BB signed an agreement that they're willing to raise our property taxes by another seven mils. Earmark designated for Erlanger to pay them off. As this thing is growing, it's growing interest every day. And they keep adding on attorney fees every time we meet or they do something. So they're telling me, depending on which letter I look at, I don't know which number they got is right or wrong, but somewhere between $9.1 to $9.4 million is where the current debt is. So it's approaching back up to the $10 million mark pretty quick. So we've got to figure out very quickly how we're going to pay that, how we're going to start making payments. What they're asking and pushing for is they want us to make those payments a million dollars at a time. And they want that every three months. So once a quarter, they want a million dollars to its pay. So it takes almost three years. If you look right here, here's how much I've got to work with, folks. I'm already at negative four million, and they want another four million a year. And then people go on social media and say, the commissioner needs to quit lying, and he needs to file bankruptcy. I wish I could. So some people say, well, I'm just going to move out of the county. We're going to go where the taxes are cheaper. We're going to go to Catoosa, or we're going to go to Whitfield County. Here's your current taxes for 2016. Murray County is the lowest. Pickens, Dave, if you look over at your total, this is unincorporated total millage for 2016. You take your county rate, your school rate, and add them together. In our region, we're fourth from the bottom. So if you have a desire to move to Chattooga, Chattooga, or Patusa, Bartow, Gordon, Whitfield, Florida, you're going to take a tax increase to move even more than what you're paying today. And your fire coverage and your homeowner's insurance is probably going to go up because most of those have a higher number on their ISO rating. As Chief Hodge showed us it's a five or six in some of those. So your homeowner's insurance will go up some too. So 
One thing that they make us do by state law in the paper is when they put out there that your property taxes are going up 20% or going up 25%, it's a little it's a little deceiving. Yes, the millage rate, when you go from 8 mils to 10 mils, yeah, that is 20%. I'm with you there. But what they don't tell you and what most people think, they think, okay, I paid $1,000 last year in taxes. If the commissioner is going up 25%, He's going to go up $250 on my tax bill. And that's not the case. Because the only number I can affect is this county millage rate. This less than eight mils currently today. Your school's over double. So I can't tax the school rate. Your school boards manage that, set that. They have full taxing authority. They're elected officials. They have full taxing authorities. So we only have one piece of the pie. We don't set the city millage rate. If you live in any of the other cities in this county, any of the five cities other than Chickamauga, Chickamauga doesn't have a property tax millage rate, but the other four do on top of this. So this is what's going to happen in 2017. These are what the unincorporated <coughs> rates for 2016 totals are. The unincorporated millage rate, this is the county's portion only through all the counties. The schools, which Walker County's come down a few thousandths of a point. I think it was 16.63 something, it's now 16.62. And when you look still across our region, from all indications, Murray County's got some software problems. They don't know what they're, where they are on their numbers yet. But you still see we're in the lower part of the pack. Now, with our change, yes, we now are going, instead of being one and a half mils cheaper than Catoosa County, we're now going to be a little over a mil higher than them. So that, that did flip, but they have a higher ISO rating for your homeowners. So basically, if you look at this, when people get on social media and they say, I'm going to move because my taxes are so high in Walker County, I'm going to go somewhere else. <coughs> They've not looked at the numbers because it's not worth their time and their hassle. I'll give you some examples of how this works because this was confusing to me. I had to sit down with Terry Gilreath, the tax assessor, a couple of times to get him to explain this to me to make sure I understood it so I could articulate it to you. But the millage rate system is very confusing, the way it's calculated. And there's probably more than one way to do this math to get to this number. But to me, in my simple mind, and to be able to explain it, this is the easiest way for me to explain it so you can understand it. We're, these are some examples. I've got three examples here we're going to go through very quickly. And I made up these examples. The formula and the principle of these all, are the, all work the same, but the numbers, I just in, inserted numbers. Okay, so this is not anybody's problem. We're going to say that you've got a house that square foot value is $83.34. So that means that property is worth $66,672. So what the tax assessor does is they take 40% of that total value. So they times that number by 40. That equals $26,669. Then, under this example, and this may or may not apply to you, but if you have a single family home in Walker County, you can sign up for a $2,000 homestead ex exemption on your primary residence. If you've got rental property, you don't get this exemption. Just on your primary home. You can get $2,000 off of that number. Okay? So when you do the math, the value for taxing, to calculate your taxes is only $24,669 where you started out up here. So what you're going to do is take that number and times it by .001 come up, you're basically just moving the decimal point to 24.669. You're going to take that number, this example is for 2016, what you paid last year. This is last year's rate. You're going to take that number times that number. So from here to here, your county tax is $193.36 on a $66,000 house. So that tells you anything <coughs> less than $66,000, that number will be less. The school tax is 
So you can see over double of what the county's portion is, is school tax, which we can't control here. This is an 800 square foot home. You're going to have your $130 fire fee. That's what it's called for, fire fee. It's $130 regardless of the size of this home. Your total tax bill on an 800 square foot home valued at $66,000 is $733.63 total. 2017, same math. New millage rate, 9.83, went up two mils. This went from a seven to a nine. It's gonna to go to $242. This here changed a little bit. Fire fee is gonna drop down to $90 because it's based off square footage. So you've got an 800 square foot house example here. This went from 130 to 90. So the tax increase, or the tax rate, is gonna be $742. When you do a comparison, this property owner is going to see a total tax increase all in of $9.11. And they're paying, uh oh, back up. They're paying $742. Folks, is that 20 or 25%? It's not. Because it's only 20% of the county portion. This here is everything added in if you live in the county your public safety fee, your school taxes. And your county taxes all added in. Your total tax increase is nine dollars and eleven cents in this example. All right, let's look at two more examples. Hundred thousand square, hundred thousand dollar value house, same square foot price. Do the math the same. County rate for 2016 is two hundred ninety-seven dollars. Got your school tax. In this example, the fire fee in 2016 is still $130. You're going to pay $1,059. 2017, this is the current year, millage rate increase, 1,200 square foot house, the fire fee is going to $120. 1,200 square foot house, it's going to go to $120. It's a $10 decrease. So there's over 10,000 property owners that's going to get a little decrease. Total taxes for 2017 is $1,125 on $100,000 value total. If you live in the county and you do have the homestead exemption. So when you do a comparison, 1,200 square foot home, $100,000 value, your taxes went are going up $65.93. All right, last example. This here is a 2,000 square foot home. Fire fee, 2016, is $130. $1,712. Look at the difference here when you get into the bigger numbers, $166,000. When I was looking at some of the information that the tax assessors are providing me in a spreadsheet, about 90% of all the values in our county are under $200,000. So, $166,000 value is going to cover probably 75 or 80% of everybody in the county on the residential. So this is how much money is going to your county government in this example. $506 plus the fire fee for 2016. So let's jump to 2017. Now your fire fee, which I should have changed that, it's actually going to be public safety fee is going to be $200. So that went from $130 to seven, went up $70 to $200 on a 2,000 square foot home. Tax bill is going to be $1,911. So there's $200 going to the fire department, public safety, which will be earmarked designated money, cannot be spent on anything else other than public safety. The tax is going to the county, $636. The school is going to get almost $1,100. When you do the comparison on a 2,000 square foot home, their taxes went up less than $200 total, everything, all in. Public safety increase, millage rate increase, and the school system going down a couple of thousands of a point. Does this help? Does this make good sense to see this? And this is something nobody's ever slowed down long enough to go over because when you read this in the paper, and it's not the paper's fault, so we're not going to throw Mike under the bus today, it's the way the state law makes us write the document. 
to put into the paper. We run an ad. So we do an ad placement in there. We have to put it in the way we do, but it's so, so confusing because people are going to think, well, my tax bill last year was $1,700. They're going up 25% or 20% or 30% or whatever the number is, and that's simply not the case here. This example is going to be less than $200 with those changes. So, any questions on this right here? Or any other questions about anything that I've presented? Before we got one more thing to cover. Yes, sir. I have a quick question, and I'm probably in the minority, but I'm a business myself. The Erlanger elephant in the room is a huge issue. We all are aware of that. We're not going to be out of it. If you know, you plan to stay in and I keep, that, keep telling myself that in my mind all the time to remind myself I didn't create any of this mess. I'm here to clean it up. None of you created this mess. We're all in this together. And so I normally don't let this stuff get to me or stress me out. I go home every night, lay down, go to sleep, go nibble away at the elephant again the next day. Most stressful, I've had two stressful weeks in eight months. The very first one, because it was just chaos, trying to figure out where he's going to get money, and last week. Because I'm trying to figure out, just like what you're saying, sir, what do we do? The more I look, the more stressed I get, because I know that's going forward. So, it has been suggested, just like you're indicating, why not just increase the millage rate another two or three meals and address it? The problem with that is, and it could still be done, the problem with that is, is we'd have to hit the full reset button and everything that we've done over the last three weeks we would have to do over. We'd have to advertise public meetings again, give two weeks notice, and then we'd have to have a minimum of three meetings to raise that millage rate. Part of the concern with that is, is there's, a, there's a lot of people that I'm hearing from in these meetings that say, look, we owe Erlanger the money that's been proven. We all owe it together, as you say. We all inherited this together. We all should take a piece of the pie. We all should have to be on the hook for a little bit. If we do it through the millage rate, not everybody pays because there's all types of exemptions. There was a whole group of young men here, very hard workers, agriculture. They get out here and work hard every day. They mentioned their agriculture exemptions. They're real. They're legal. They need to take them. But if we put this on the millage rate, a lot of that, they're going to get exempt of those. There's exemptions by age. If you're age 70, 75, under certain conditions, you can, in certain circumstances, once you get 75, you can be exempt of all of your property taxes and school taxes except for the public safety fee. So it's not equitable and fair to everybody. So I've been very open the last month especially the last two weeks of trying to get input from people. That's one reason why I'm glad people come to these meetings and say, what other ideas? Let's brainstorm and work together on this because we've got to figure out a solution because as you make a very solid point, <coughs> doing nothing is not a good option. Doing nothing is only going to force a federal court order or it, and it's going to incur more cost and it's going to be <coughs> millions of dollars more cost. And so one thing to come up in the Thursday meeting that I've been working on and looking at is a debt service fee. You have your millage rate, you have your public safety fee. We would add, we have the ability to add another fee to the tax bill 
that would be applied to everybody, no exemptions, then the big question is, is what's equitable or what's fair or how do we approach that? Do we do a flat fee? In the Thursday meeting, they started doing the math and say, well, hey, if everybody paid about $133 per partial, across the board, everybody takes an even slice of the pie, in a couple of years, we can pay Erlanger off, depending on where we settle out of it. Just, you know, it's just kind of a working number from an idea standpoint. And some people say, well, wait a minute. You just fix that problem with your public safety fee. You've got somebody in a half a million dollar home versus somebody in a $50,000 home, and everybody's paying the same. That's not equitable. So that's what I've been wrestling with, is how to go about this to make it as equitable without putting any hardship or undue burden on anybody. Nobody wants to pay Erlang or anything. I have talked, I've negotiated, I've had other people at the table, I've talked to attorneys, I've done everything I could to figure out how to get out from under it, eliminate it, reduce it, kick the can down the road, and I am running out of options. So one thing that I wanted to show you here today is a possible idea. Kind of like what you're talking about, we got to do something. So, kick this around a little bit, I want y'all's input on this. This will be based off of, of excess value, what your top number is, what your total property appraises for at the assessor's office. So we've got two or three hundred properties that are probably landlocked or they're floodplains or entranceway of a subdivision where there's a decorative planner or sign or something. There's two or three hundred partials out there that are valued less than two thousand dollars total. They pay about three to five bucks in taxes a year for the county. If we put a $20 minimum on all of those less than $2,000, then from $2,000 to $35,700, put a minimum of $50. And there's several thousands of those. And then from there, we take an example of a 0.14%. So when you convert that to a decimal, that's a 0.0014. So that's not even a quarter of 1%. So when you take some examples, so let's just say that you had a four or $500 cap on this. Here's some examples. $50,000 pieces of property or assessed value would be $70. $100,000 would be 140. 200,000 be 280. Again, at the $200,000 mark of property value, that's going to cover about 90% of everybody in this county at that number right there. But I think this makes it somewhat equitable across the board. Or we can come right here about the middle and be about $130 or $135 and everybody pay the same. So I've been wrestling with this because if we do this, I could pass an ordinance. And let me tell you, how many of y'all get to vote on this? Just me. We're the only state in the country that has a sole form of government, sole commissioner form of government. We are one of eight. I've got the burden of this on my shoulders. Yeah, this would be a home or property. It would be a per partial what you get a tax bill for. Yes, sir. About three years. We could we could take this, I could pass an ordinance, put this minimum in, put the maximum in, put that rate in, and say in three years this goes away. We get Erlanger out of our life in three years or less. One thing about this that I like, it being a fee, a debt service fee, 100% of that money would be designated earmarked to go strictly 100% to debt service. So if this collected more than what we needed to pay up to Erlanger, we could take whatever we got left coming in and apply it directly against our $70 million that we've got. Now in that $70 million, that does include the 8.7 to Erlanger. So we would be chipping away at that $70 million by having this fee for three years. 
So the $70 million of debt we have total includes all of our debt, which also includes our land. So we could take this in your market, everything off the top, to go to Erlanger to try to get them paid off as quick as we can, and we could do that in less than three years, or within three years. And in three years, this tax would go away. Well, I say tax, it's a fee. But it feels like a tax. But legally, it's a fee. Yes, ma'am. getting our revenue and our financial house in order is going to help us. They're really not going to care if we survive or not. Technically, they're wanting their money, and they've got a federal court summary judgment stating that they have the rights to those dollars. They also have a document stating they can raise your taxes by seven mils additional. So they could come up one day and go to court. We've got another hearing coming up in September. I think it's the 9th. They could take us back to court and the judge would order a tax increase by federal law I would have to implement per delivery of the CEO of our land. And that's what BB signed? That's what BB signed. Okay. Is there Why is she not prosecuted? Why can we not prosecute? It wasn't an illegal deal. It was a stupid deal. Yeah. You know, I asked the CEO of our land, I said, let me, let me run this through, you, through your mind here a moment, Mr. Spiegel. I said, you took an insolvent hospital that was over $60 million in debt and you loaned it $20 million. He said, well, it's before I got here, it's a prior administration. I said, okay, that's fair. It's prior to you, it's prior to me. But still, the leadership before you borrowed $20 million from Erlen. To make matters worse, they sent over an A-team management team. They sent over their best and their brightest managers to come to Hutchison to manage the hospital. Now here's where they made another big mistake. They still had to work under the existing board of Hutchison that run it off the cliff to start with. So you've got an A-team management team that's got their hands tied because anything out of the box or anything over the top they want to do, they've got to go back to that dysfunctional board they run it off the cliff and get their approval. So then you got a management team and a board doing this all the time. And having closed door meetings and executive sessions and on and on and on. Then, third step to make it worse, one of the two counties that they used to guarantee the debt was insolvent. Because we had millions and millions of dollars of debt before she ever signed the deal. I said, so you took a bad loan that a bank wouldn't have loaned the hospital money, working under a bad board to have a bad county guaranteed. I said, what did they expect the outcome to be? He said, well, I see your point. He said, it was a bad deal I would have never done. And I said, I'm with you. I said, we should have given you the place. If, if, if our hospital's so broke that they can come in and fix it, they're willing to put the money into it, hand them the deed, give it to them. But that's not what happened. So the federal courts, back to your question, are telling us it's a legal, binding, authentic transaction. So well, there wasn't sense. anything illegal done. It was just that Even we had to pay. That, is it because she didn't report what all the money was out why we can't No, it's that... None of us were watching. We were all asleep. We trusted. We trusted. That's right. Nobody was watching. I can't go in and legally obligate somebody else to pay 
pay money. Why, why could she? Your government can. Anytime the government goes in debt, just like our national debt in Washington, all citizens of this country are obligated for a piece of that pie, the natural, de national, national debt. That's why we all pay federal income taxes or part of the I'm obligating the full faith and credit and the citizens of Walker County when I went to the bank and borrowed that $8 million. I wasn't creating new debt. I was taking and borrowing money to pay the old debt and to keep operations going because they took the operations money and spent it on past debt. And so I'm not creating any new debt. I'm just trying to cash flow this thing. We talked about those tax anticipation notes. One thing I forgot to mention. A tax anticipation note, or a TAN, the way I like to understand and explain that is it's payday lending for governments. That's what that is. You're going to the loan sharks, so to speak, in a lot, in some cases in the past, because all the local lenders quit lending. So they had to go out of town to the investment bankers, the high risk guys, pay high rates, high fees, and you're going to the payday lending. Because payday for a county government is when their property taxes are due. So December 20th is payday for Walker County government. We'll get the lion's share of our income, our taxes into this county by December 20th or before. By December 31st, by state law, and by contract with the bank. All $8 million has to be paid back. So I'm going to have to take money that's coming into December that's supposed to run this county through 2018 and use that to pay last year's expenses. It's that cycle of that payday lending. Once you get in the cycle, it's hard to break it. Now our cash flow projections are showing us we've already gone all the way up through 2018. If everything stays consistent, we have no natural disasters or no EF4 tornadoes because we've got no reserves. We will not have to borrow money in 2018 until along about June on the TAN. And at that point, to get us through the year, we're only going to need $6 million, which is $2 million less than we've got now. So our plan is, and our cash flow is showing us, over the next three years, three to four years, we're going to try and work hard to come off those TANs by about $2 million a year. So in four years, we're out of the payday lending business. We've got to get off that. It's like the crack cocaine for government. It's addictive. And what most counties done, it's, it's, it's just an addictive thing. And this county's done it and several around us. Every year you go back and get a little more. Go get a little more. And you're in a state that can't bankrupt. Bankers want to do a deal. They just give you a little more. And next thing you know, you're up to here. Yes, ma'am. ago that I loved. It says charge $100 per vehicle. Charge a wheel tax. $100. There's almost 70,000 vehicles in Walker County registered. Well, you got sales tax. You got something that every citizen we have to figure out for every citizen is paying and not just And that's, that's what I'm struggling with because like the wheel tax I thought it was a great idea. After I talked to four attorneys because the first three I didn't Take their word for it. I contacted four attorneys to see if there was some way possible we could do a will tax. I felt like that was a fair way. Okay. I talked to the Association of County Commissioners. I talked to our current tax commissioner, Carolyn Walker. She even called the commissioner of the Department of Revenue. All of them told us the same thing. You don't have legal authority as sole commissioner to do that. You have no authority to do that. And somebody said, okay, well, you're talking about sales tax. 
Just take your local option sales tax and raise it another percent. I don't have legal authority to do that. It would take no, no. It would take a local, it would take a legislative act through the state house and senate and the governor's signature. One thing that we do have, this is another thing we need to talk about, is we will have on the ballot in November of this year a T splosh, a single county T splosh. That is a transportation splosh that will be one, one percent. Now, with that, here's why we need that. Some people say, well, make it 2%. Go up 2%. The state law says, the statute says, I can only go up as much as 1% on a T-splosh. It caps out. I can do a quarter, a half, three-quarter, or 1%. One, one Can't go over 1%. So here's the situation I've got. Right now, today, we've got a bank account at the Bank of Lafayette that's got right at a million dollars cash in. It's a grant from the state of Georgia Department of Transportation. My hands are tied, I cannot use that money. Even though it's in our bank account, it's in a separate account. The reason we can't use it is we have to put a 30% match with it. So I gotta have $300,000 cash to go with a million dollars to use it to resurface roads or to replace bridges. My hands are tied. I don't have 300,000. For me to access that money, I'd have to go borrow the money. And I just have no desire to do that, to go borrow more money, to put this county more in debt to access the million dollars. So what do you think is going to happen come December of this year? No, we're not going to lose it. That's, that's an obvious guess. They're going to send me another million dollars. They're going to send me my 2018 grant money for roads. So now I'm going to have $2 million in the bank. I need $600,000. Just doubles my problems. And all I'm doing is sitting in my office and I get a letter in the mail. The state says, we're going to send you a million dollars. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I can't spend a million you've already sent me. So if we get you as citizens in November to vote yes on the T-Splosh, we can take, instead of having to go borrow that money or pay it out of the general fund, we can take that T-splosh money and match that, grant, match that grant with it. Okay, so that will save us $600,000 out of our general fund. We don't have to go in debt. We can resurface a mile of road for about $100,000. So we can resurface 20 or 30 miles of road all at one time with a T-splosh. But I can't go over 1% and I can't add any other tax. That's not helping on Well, if you notice, it talked about financial position. A lot of it has to do what they look at. It's not included in the number is the condition of your roads. Here's the best way to look at this. If you are happy with your county roads, and you have no desire for any roads to be paved in this county over at least the next two to three years, vote no. Just vote no. Because what will happen to us after three years, we have to start sending that money back. Because you can only hold that money for three years. On that fourth year, that furthest year out, you've got to spend, you've got to send that million dollars back. So we'll be in a position we don't come up with the money, we'll have to start sending that money back or we lose it. I mean, we'll lose it because we've got to send it back. Then, you won't have no road. then we won't have any roads. So if y'all want to go back to tar and gravel and jerk roads, because I have no desire to go in debt to pave these roads. I'm trying to get us out of debt and find ways to match funds. And, and, and you're right, sales tax is the most fair tax that we've got. No taxes are good, but it's the most fair tax we have is a sales tax. Okay. But the state limits me of what I can do of how I, can, how I don't have the option to raise sales tax other than this transportation. Five years ago or so, there was a regional T-splosh. About 16 counties taking all their money, pulling it together to build even more roads. I voted no for that because all of our money was, we were going to be a donor county for the most part. Our T-splash money was going to go to other counties. 
with a single county T splosh of that 1%, 100% of that money will be spent in Walker County and the cities within here. So we're estimating that that revenue will bring in about $3 million a year. The county will get 75% of that to use to resurface roads, work on roads, do maintenance of roads. We've got about five bridges that the state says school buses cannot cross them because they're not safe for our school buses. Folks, how sad is that? First time I heard that, it just broke my heart. Well, you live, we live in a county in the 21st century where we've got not one bridge, but five bridges that they say are not safe enough for your kids and your grandkids to get on a school bus and ride across it because it might fail. Yes, ma'am. Yes. true value. But what we would do on this, we would put a cap in of say four or five hundred dollars. So you would you you would cap out. that was suggested that I think is a fair way looking at different options that's what we're doing we're looking at different options is to charge it per person there's about 68 69,000 people all men women and children in this county if we could assess every person in this county a hundred dollars per person but our challenge is and this is where I don't have the answer for is where do we get those numbers how do we know how do we know who to build what We don't have access to that data, plus it's a moving target because it's not updated, but every 10 years, and we're on the end, toward the end of that cycle. So we've got no database to know if you've got two people in your home or five people in your home. But there's no consolidated database that we've got access to from county government or through the assessor's office that anybody's been able to produce or show me that will tell us by address how many people live there. Plus, we're running out of time. Because if we're going to do anything at all, the tax commissioner, the tax assessor is waiting for me as the commissioner to finalize everything to get it to them before the end of this month. So they can take and do all the calculations they've got to do in their systems. They've got to go to the state and get the digest approved. They've got to get the tax bills printed. And it's going to take them about a month to get all that done to try to get the bills out on time by October the 1st. So they're cracking the whip on me saying, hey, you can't drag this out past the first of the month. You've got to make a decision. What I'm trying to do is be open and transparent with everyone and say, I don't have all the answers. I'm a big enough man to admit that. I'm looking for input and suggestions. It's not going to be easy for us. It's going to be painful. Yes, Greg? What, what if, what if, how much, how much is our tax bill going to go up, Commissioner, if 
if we were under the federal court mandate, if we get the two mills and, and their mandate is seven mills, so they can come in and levy our, our tax dollars at the commission's office, right. that's, that'll be nine mills. Well, if you go back here to give you an example, it might get about the same as school tax. That's right. That's a good way to look at it. it. It'd be, it'd just be, yeah. you go, you go from what it is now to double the school tax. Be about it'd double be what your school tax is if they live in seven mills. That's a good question. That's a good explanation. It'd be about that number right there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Have you figured what like, say, our taxes go up? It, it's twenty percent in the unincorporated okay. area. Twenty percent. Is there? A Yeah, that brings us in projected a little over two million dollars. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What and this I'm just thinking. If we could go up um, that for that public safety. Right. And we've already bought new trucks. Why can't that move go for Okay, we have not bought any new trucks. That's a misconception out there. They're all in inventory. The fire department's got over 80 vehicles yeah. that were all here when myself and Chief Hodge come on duty day one. Right. We've countywide. We have not bought any equipment, trucks, tractors, nothing. nothing. The most expensive thing that I have purchased that I've initiated was the blinds in the conference room were about to fall off and it was making the room so hot and I spent about 1200 bucks. But we have those trucks. Yeah, they, were already, they were sitting in the fire halls not being used. Okay, so we, so we are using them now. We are now why to reduce costs. Instead cost. of raising that public safety, why can't that money go towards paying off our debt? That was, that's designated funds for the public safety. The public safety will generate more revenue, but the fire department is going to have to operate on a budget that's round numbers $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year less than what that same department utilized in 2016. So they're going to be operating on less money than was spent in 2016. They're getting a budget cut too. So Chief Hodge is taking a budget cut, and he's doing all of those things that he explained to you today on top of a budget cut. The difference in that money is going to keep us from having to pull it out of the general fund, the shortfall, and it's also going to cover the cost of the Puckett EMS ambulance service and also the emergency management cost, about $100,000 a year with all the expenses there. So we're basically trying to take stress, financial stress, off of the general fund and get an entity of the fire public safety to be self-supportive and self-sufficient, which it's supposed to be. Because part of the reason for that is the only city that's involved in that program is Chickamauga. The other cities have their own fire department. So if we're funding that operation by funding it out of the general fund, People that live in the city of Lafayette, city of Rossville, Lookout Mountain, and the portion of Fort Oathorpe is paying for a service that they don't get. Now, you do have the mutual aid, and they do work together and things, but technically, they're being double billed for their fire service. So that's why that entity needs to be self-sustaining and stand on its own and be funded. And then also, too, they don't have to worry about their budgets getting cut or not having the money there, and if they've got money left over, they can save it. They don't have to worry about, hey, if I don't spend that line item, they're going to take it away at the end of the year. They don't have that problem. That money will just roll over into that designated account. So if they have a large purchase or something, they can pay cash for it. Well, I mean, I understand all this, and it sounds great. But the fact is, there's a lot of people that just can't do it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's painful. Can't. But what concerns me is that with this Erlanger, if we're not careful, if we sit back, it's going to be about $2 million more than what it is today by next year. Yes, sir. Red shirt. The commission a minute ago, I believe, said that this piece of washing money would be 
pay about three million a year. Yeah, the, the county would get seventy five percent of that. Okay. A little over two million. Okay. Well, I thought we what would we just take and uh, match to three hundred mid three hundred thousand or six hundred thousand. Right. So that we can get the federal money or state money for the roads and take the rest of that money and go to the debt early. Can't do it. It's, it's earmarked money because it's being a transportation splice. The state mandates that that money is designated for all things transportation in your county. You can't take it and use it to buy, as an example, police cars or to pay debt with it unless it was debt or, industrial. or an industrial park. Unless it's debt, it was created by building roads or paving roads. It would be the only way you could pay the debt off. One thing, too, that they've done in the past, when they've done these, this, the regular splash, they would go and bond against it or borrow against it. So when you go to the poll and vote on it, you're also voting and authorizing the county government to leverage it, borrow against it, to get those projects started right away. We are not going to leverage or bond that money. We're going to use it as it comes in. That way we get to use every dollar. We're not paying bond attorneys and interest Plus, sales taxes are up and down, uh, very, very inconsistent sales taxes the way they come in. So it's unpredictable. So we're estimating $3 million. We may get a little more, may get a little less. But if you're not leveraging against it, you just accept what comes in, and then you're okay. And you just spend it as you go. But if we don't get it, there's no money in the budget to do any road paving. We're, we'll patch holes as we can. But we've got a crumbling infrastructure of roads that's been neglected. And we've got five bridges that need to be replaced. Yes, sir. I think it's uh, about 648 miles of county road. Well, you can pay about $100,000 per mile average. So if you've got $3 million, you can do 30 miles. So we're going to borrow money to pay. No, sir, we're not going to borrow money. Or don't pay tax to pay for more than But that's over a five year period. So the state's going to continue to send us a million dollars a year. We're going to have over two million dollars a year, two and a half million dollars a year coming in off the T splash. So we'll have over three million dollars a year to work with. Right now we've got that much. Zero. So we're going to go from zero to over $3 million a year on a five year splice to be able to pay roads. Pardon? And so we can hit the main thoroughfares, the highly traveled, or the roads that are in extreme distance of repair that have the most traffic and do it systematically. So that, that's, that's a lot of our key roads. Yes, sir. We've reduced that staff. I think we're probably down to about 20. That's another thing that's happened. There was uh, 26 people that worked for the previous administration that doesn't work for me today. Some of them left on their own. Some of them had some help leaving. I took those 26 jobs. And I created two new positions, <clears throat> public relations, and we didn't have a human resource person. Over 400 employees, we didn't have a human resource department. It's crazy. So I created those two new positions. So I hired a total of five people to replace 26 people. So that's a net savings of 21 full-time jobs with benefits. That nets out to a savings of $1.2 million. This past year, 2016, they spent $26 million in expenses. This year, as of last Thursday, under my administration, we've not even broke the $20 million mark yet. Now, it's projecting to get through September. We've got to get through September of this year. It's projecting that we'll spend a little over $21 million. We think that number's low. That number with some year-end expenses and things we've got, that number's probably going to be pushed up closer to $24 million, in fairness. 
that's going to be about two million dollars less than they spent last year. And out of this budget cycle that we're in, the first three months of this was under the prior administration spending. Because they didn't leave office till January. This budget started in October. So all of October, all of November, all of December is in this $20 million, just shot a $20 million number here. So as you look at it, our total revenue has been just shy of $22 million. We spent less than $20. We're ahead over revenue by two and a half, almost $2.5 million. And we're, so far, we're $6 million under last year, but we know that's going to catch up, probably going to be a couple of million. So people say, in fairness, if you're asking us to pay more taxes, what have you done? What have you cut? And we've cut, and we're still cutting, and out of the budget request, we've got to cut another $4 million to get a balanced budget. So for the first time in a very, very long time, county government's doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that's minding its own finances first before they turn to the taxpayer. That's not been done in the past. They didn't turn to you for your property taxes, they turned to lenders to borrow more money. Yes, sir. Well, it looks to me that the uh, past administration over 16 years, they just went, well, yeah, this sounds good, let me sign the check. Yep, this now, let me, let me borrow some money over here, buddy. Okay, now then, uh, kind of bought Mountain Cove Farm, got a lien against it, correct? That's correct. Lien against this bill. Yes, sir. And the agriculture. Yes, Nothing sir. to be done with it. That's correct. What happened to the, uh, uh, EPA fine was hidden because of a uh, bridge that was put in. Yeah, dump out uh, Rock Creek up on Lookout Mountain, the EPD fines. I've not seen or heard or have even found the file on that yet. Uh, it could still be potentially hanging out there. Uh, I haven't found anything on it yet, and I've not heard from it. Uh, that, that was a sore subject because of. Uh, I can't remember where I read it, but we didn't find something like that. I think it was either $1,000 a week. Yeah, there for a while. I think the fine ended up being what I was being told, somewhere around 60000 or something. I mean, if they did send us a bill for that, I mean, we could write a check for that and get that done. But the clock quit ticking once they got on the final sign off on it. But you're right, there was for a period of time, it was several thousand dollars on the white. Well, then, uh, was there no one holding the past administration uh, responsible for uh, expenditures and checks and balances? I mean, the controller couldn't do it? The controller would tell them all the time, you can't afford to do that, how are we going to pay this? And the simple answer was, we got to do it, we've got no choice, do it anyway. And so they would raise the flag, raise the flag, raise the flag, it would be ignored. And so us citizens, and I'm number one in line, was not watching government. I'm glad you're here today to watch government, to watch me, to hold me accountable. Because if you're holding me accountable, I'm going to shine the spotlight on everything. Because I want you to see where we are. But you're right. No, no one in this county, nor the state. That's another little story I'll tell you real quick, and Leon, I'll come to you in the back. When I started borrowing money this year to pay off the past two bills, I went to Bank of Lafayette. They loaned me $4 million. Very grateful, very great to work with. About mid-May, I started looking for the other four million. I contacted eight banks. Five of them told me no in the first conversation. The other three said, we'll look at it. Got it down where I got offers from two banks. But I got nervous, extremely nervous, after the first five said no. So I contacted Senator Mullis. I said, we've got to have some help. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm about to be to the point here in about two or three weeks, I'm not going to have money to pay payroll. And I've been turned down by five banks. He said, we've got to get the state to help us. They won't allow me to bankrupt. We've got to get the state to help us. He said, I'll set up the meeting. So the very next week, I had a meeting down at the Capitol in his office. He had the commissioner of the Department of Revenue, the top person, was appointed by the governor. He had the state treasurer who reports directly to the governor, who's over all of the finances of the state. Department of Community Affairs Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner. 
And then GFA, which is an acronym for a government agency, had their commissioner and deputy commissioner all in Senator Mullis's conference room to meet with me. And so to make sure I had their attention, I asked them a simple question. Do you want to count it back on a Friday or a Monday? Which is easiest for you? Because I'm about to hand you my resignation, the certificate, certificate signed by the governor saying that I'm a legitimate sole commissioner that's sitting on my desk. I take the certificate, my resignation, and my keys and walk into the governor's office and hand it to him. And say, Governor, you just got to check him. I got to have some help. Scared them to death. They said, we don't know what to do. So I went over some financial stuff, give them some information, give them information they're used to looking at. I mean, they, they know the stuff I'm giving them. And they're sitting there with their jaws dropped, folks. They said, we don't know what to do. And I said, well, you're the top of the top. You're in the governor's cabinet, so to speak. The guy from GIFA spoke up. He said, well, I can help you. He said, we've got you. Part of your debt is a million-dollar loan to your landfill to do the landfill expansion. I said, yes. He said, the interest is you've got here on your sheets 3.13%. I said, correct. He said, I can take your interest rate. I have the authority to take your interest rate since that's a loan from the state. I can cut it in half. And I can defer your payments for 12 months to give you some cash flow. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Who's next? I was going to pass the plate. Who's next? That's as far as we got. They said, we don't have the legal authority to do anything unless you go before the legislative body and get some sort of assistance or something that all the legislators across the state have got to vote on, and the governor's got to sign off on. And oh, by the way, they don't go back into session until February. This was in May, June. So basically, they said, you're on your own. You've got to raise revenues. You notice they didn't say raise taxes. They said raise your revenues. That's code word, folks. <laughs> That's code word for raising your taxes. And you've got to cut expenses. I said, well, we're already doing that, but I haven't had the opportunity yet to even adjust or affect the revenue yet, which is your taxes and your fees. And they said, our hands are tied. Until you get into the legislative session, there's nothing really anybody can do. You're on your own. So here I am again to repeat myself. In a state you can't bankrupt, and I'm one of eight sole commissioners, and I've inherited a $70 million debt and got a bank account that's overdrawn, basically. Why do I want the job? Great, great question. When I went and got copies of the audits because I got suspicious, my wife said, first thing, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. Several weeks go by. She came home one day mad as a hornet. A local county employee came into her office and said, I'm so excited your husband's running for commissioner. It's all over Lafayette. She said, he's not running for commissioner. He'll be a divorce man. She come home mad at me to tell me you need to drop this. I said, I'm not running for commissioner. That's the furthest thing from my mind. I just want to know what's going on. I'm on the city council in Chickamauga. I'm in the family business. Oh, by the way, dad's retiring the first of the year. I've got to run the business. So I'm not running for commissioner. She said, you're darn right you are not running. So that went on for several months. A friend of mine called me one day. He said, hey, there's a group of local leaders getting together. So they've got got this thing figured out. So they've got what figured out? They've got it narrowed down to the two people that's got the ability and the electability to be sole commissioner. And said the top guy's willing to run. I said, fantastic. He said, and they want you to come to the meeting because you've been digging into this. I said, great, I'll be there. When is it? I'm all in. Let's, I'm going to help whoever's running against that current administration because I saw the books. And he said, well, it's Jim Patton of Lafayette. I said, perfect. I'm in. We talked to him. I said, who's the second person? He said, it's you. I said, forget it. I'm out. I'm not running. Period. 
This is no, this is no go. Forget it. Long story short, we met with Jim. He was all excited that lasted about two weeks. He called me one day. He says, I'm not running. You should run. I'm out. Got sick to my stomach again. Went home, told my wife, Jim Patton's not running. She says, you want your divorce papers? How soon? You're not running. I said, I know. I'm not running. She says, I told you you should have never went to that meeting. I said, I'm not running. So I went to another person. I said, hey, you need to run. He said he would. Went a couple, three weeks. He decided he wasn't running. So I knew the pressure was on. I started avoiding people. So I knew I was in trouble. I was running as hard as I could run. The whole time my wife's telling me, no, no, no. And I'm saying, you're exactly right. So about, I don't know, another month or so, my wife come home one day. She said, you know you're supposed to run for commissioner. I said, what? She said, God's been telling me I've been fighting it. I'm tired of fighting it. You need to <laughs> surrender to the call. You're supposed to run for commissioner. I said, I don't think so. She said, it's on you now. I've given it up. I've accepted it. So I'm thinking, I can't. So the very next week, we have the family board meeting at Whitfield Oil Company. Finish the meeting. The, the board is real complicated. It's dad, mom, and myself. Get to the end of the meeting. Mom said, by the way, you've been working on that, trying to find somebody to run for commissioner. Who's running? I said, well, here's what happened. Mom likes all the details. I give y'all just the cliff notes. Mom likes all the details. Give her all the details. She shook her head. She said, so what are you going to do? I said, I'm not going to do anything. I said, try to find somebody. Dad sitting over there quiet. He heard a pin drop. I said, what's going on? Mom said, we knew four months ago you were supposed to run for commissioner. I said, who told you? She said, God did. That God told us four months ago, was preparing us for this, I was telling your dad he wasn't going to retire. And I look over at my dad, I said, What are you talking about? We've been planning this for years. He said, Well, there's got to be a reason why I'm almost 75 years old. I'm in great health. I take no medication, never have. Only had one surgery, had my appendix out about five years ago, and past that, I've never been in the hospital. There must be a reason why I'm still healthy. And he said, I guess it's because you're supposed to run for commission. And he said, I'm supposed to keep working. And he said, so you better get after it. He said, because I know how you are. I've worked with you since you was a little boy. I know you've got the ability. I know you've got the drive. And I know you've got God's blessing. Get after it. That was a hard conversation. So I struggled with that for several days. Decided, okay, God, this is what I'm supposed to do. Let's get on. <clears throat> Put a group of people together, about seven people had a meeting. Said, we're going to have a kickoff event. We're going to clear the air. And we're going to level the field. We're going to let everybody in Walker County know that I am running. The rumors have turned out to be true. So we got everything done in 13 days, and we packed this place up. Had a free event, had over 400 people show up. I understand they ran out of parking. I knew then it was real. I knew it was really real. Because from what people were telling me, nobody had ever done anything quite like that. To be a newcomer, less than two weeks' notice to get over 400 people here to show up for an event that's political. I knew it was real. And so, to answer the question with a long explanation, I'm doing this because I feel like God's called me to do it. So what you're telling us basically is we have somebody that single-handedly put us into this horrible situation. No, she had help. Well, okay. Uh, but she was a sole commissioner. So That's correct. We fell on her show. That's basically. correct. She's ultimately responsible. Into this terrible situation. Correct. That is put every business, every individual in Walker County in a financial Wandering on what to do, and there is nothing we can do. She did nothing illegal. I think that's a pretty good summary of where we are. Now, going forward from a legal aspect, I cannot answer that. That's outside of my knowledge scope. 
It's outside of my lane of what I'm supposed to be responsible for. That's got to be left up to the state, the GBI, the district attorney, and so on and so forth. There are some things that were done wrong. Now, how illegal or what the penalties for those are, I don't know. Because one example, she openly has admitted in public multiple times that she misappropriated funds, which is against the law. She took $9.1 million of splash money that was designated money, openly used that to finish the industrial park, and said that one day we would all thank her for it because it's our future. That $9.1 million we could have used against our grant match, which would have turned into over five years, would have turned into $15.5 million. We could have paved 155 miles of roads roughly on average asphalt state consistent crossfire. But instead, they openly took and misappropriated, earmarked, designated, voted on funds by us, the citizens. That's illegal. It's been well documented. It's been well reported. Where's the cow? I don't know. So what I've had to do is just brush that off, and I've got to focus on moving forward when people ask me publicly, I tell them that same thing. Here's what I know. I don't know if there's any investigations going on or not. I don't know. But I don't have the authority to prosecute or put anybody in jail. And with all these problems and all these deadlines and these creditors and Erlang are breaking down my back, at least for now, this year, i got to move forward. The past is still going to be there. The results are still there. Nothing there is changing. Something may happen in the future, but as of today, me as the commissioner, I've got to continue to move us forward, be transparent with you, because I want the light to be shined on all of this, because I don't want you to come up two years from now and think the commissioner put a $70 million in debt. The commissioner Whitfield put a $70 million in debt. I want you to see it today. And it's in the audit. There, for some reason, and we've gone over this and over this and over this at every meeting, People think we bought those QRVs, those quick response vehicles. We, we didn't. I mean, go to the fire stations and look. You can see the, no. the stickers on them. And talk to the employees. Man, if you want to get the good scoop on stuff, talk to the employees. They'll tell you that's stuff they've had in the base for years. Now, when it was bought back in 2002, 2003, I bet you it was brand new because they normally didn't buy anything used. I'm sure it was new back in 2002. But it's been paid for for years. We've bought no new fire equipment. This fire staff under Chief Hodge's leadership and his command team has done a fantastic job of working with little. Now, I know $3 million is a lot, but when you're trying to run and cover over 700 something square miles and 68, 69,000 people, 24 7, 365, $3 million doesn't go far. And so I commend them for what they've done, commend Chief Hodge for his leadership. Everything that he presented to you today and every change that's been made has come from him and his team. So in the business world, you would say that come from the bottom up. Okay, I didn't say I want you to do this, 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 and this. They brought those ideas, those solutions. They analyzed the numbers. They come to me and said, we need your approval to do this. Everything that he's brought to me, except for one item, we just hadn't got it done yet. We've approved and moved forward with everything he's brought to me. Yeah, what yes. What would you say again? Um, she brought up the tax about for sales tax, and that's what I was going to bring up. Right. Who has to start that? The state legislature, Senator Mullis. Senator Mullis would have to introduce a bill into the Senate, get all the senators to the majority to vote on it. All the House members are majority to vote on it, and the governor to sign it. Not saying it's impossible, but I think the odds are against us, and the reason I say that is that that kind of opens up the box at the state. If they do it for one, they've got to do it for all. And they may be ready to do that. It might, I might be surprised. But at best, if that was to happen, if Senator Mullis walked in here today and he said, citizens, I'm going to lead the charge. I can get it done. I'll push it through. I'll make it happen. The soonest that could be implemented would be July of next year. It's just like this T-splash, another good example. 
Once you vote and approve that in November, by law, it cannot even start to be collected until April of 2018. So the vendors collect it, they remit it in May, the state processes it in June. We hope to maybe get our first check in July of next year. And you got to buy in Walker County for us to see. That's right, and you got to buy in Walker County to get it. Yes, ma'am. Got better, yes. And you mentioned Mount Co Farms. So, what are some of the expenses and stuff? And how should we be such an expense and be trying to get the money to the debt? Right, great question about Mount Co Farms. Where are we at with Mount Co Farms? And what are we doing with the money? The first year they opened up Mount Co Farms, it lost $925,000. So, it lost almost a million dollars. The next year, it lost like $666,000. They got it down to half a million. This year is probably going to lose somewhere around a quarter million dollars. Again, three months of that was on the prior administration. They had a lot of fun down there and had a lot of events and the county fair and Christmas and all kind of stuff that drove up those first quarter expenses. We've got three less staff people down there, which your employees and your, your personnel cost is always your most expensive. So we've cut three staff people. I would love to sell it. Love to. I've got a couple of people interested in buying it that has contacted me. Here's the big hurdle I got. This is one of my big hurdles. Is there's a $15 million lien against it. And so, to sell it, we'd have to go to the bond company and tell them, hey, we've got an offer on the table for X number of million dollars. They want to buy this. I need you to release it. And we'd have another good laugh because they would sit there and laugh with me. And they'd go, really? You want us to release it? Yeah, and I'll give you all the money. And they'd say, well, wait a minute. Let's look at this. They'd look at it and go, wait a minute. Your financial position, your net position, has got incredibly worse. I mean, you're higher risk today than you've ever been. And you want us to release a secured asset to give us a few million dollars that doesn't cover the bill. We're going to think about this. Or if we do it, here's what it's going to cost you. Or we can go to another lender, another bond company, and say, hey, I got this deal over here. I don't want to wake the giant up yet. I want to be able to get the money from you, pay this, go over and pay them off, and do a switcheroo. That's extremely expensive, very time consuming, and probably 50 50 shot at best we can get it done because of the financial position we're in. So, plan B the fastest thing we can do, the most cost effective thing we can do, is lease it out. So we've been working on a request for proposal that we're getting ready to send out. We'll send it out advertising in the marketplace for different businesses or individuals to come back with proposals of telling us, A, what they would use it for, what improvements they would make to it, and how much they're willing to pay the county to do so. And if we lease it out, then all the expenses stop immediately, and we may possibly start getting a little revenue off of it. Right now, it has been a big money loser. It's lost millions of dollars. The county should never have been in it. We need to get out of that business. Uh, an entrepreneur that wants us to do it and be there and grow it, they could probably make a decent living there. But the most expensive way to do anything, and I always remember this, the most expensive way to do anything is to let government do it. I could go over there and run that, or you could go over there and run that, especially those of y'all that've got agriculture and farm experience, you could go over there and run it probably for half of what it would cost me to send county employees down there to do it. So private business can always, always, always do things cheaper and better than government. So we need out of that business. We have kept it going because if we shut it all down, then the value of it drops quickly. So we're trying to keep the reservations coming in so when we put the proposal out, we can say, hey, it's an ongoing business that's viable, that has bookings out X number of months, X number of bookings, and oh, by the way, these employees know how to run it. Do you want them to go work for you now? How many of these people do you want to work for you? If not, they can apply for open positions that may be in the county at that time, which we now post on the county website, which has never been done before, or we'll have to lay them off. But we want to get out of that before this year's over, if all possible. Yes, LeBron, I'm sorry. 
Or Leon. Is the development authority asking my bill to be included in the bill? In the audit. Good question. Is the development authority, the Walker County Development Authority, are their assets and liabilities and their books included <laughs> in this audit? Yes, this is the first time that I can find record that it ever happened. Back in 2015, the authority board voted to have an audit done because they didn't have a record of what had been done. By law, we were supposed to do one every year. They had not been doing one. One of the board members, Robert Wardlaw, realized that and said, hey, we need to have an audit. He made a motion, got approval, the unanimous vote, ordered an audit. Three months later or so, you look in the minutes, they come up, where's the audit? All they're working on. Make sure you get the audit done. Well, it kind of fell off the radar. We get in office. I say, where's the audit? That's a good question. So I met with the CPA firm. Where's the audit? We never finished it. Why? Well, Don Oliver told us to stop. So what do you mean told you to stop? Well, he's the county attorney. He called us up and said, hey, that audit you're working on for the Delta Authority, we don't need it anymore, stop. I said, did the board approve that? He said, I don't know. He said, we were told to stop because the money was fixing the stop. So I said, I want that audit for 2016 done, and I want it included in this one. He said, well, you can't do that. I said, why? He said, well, it needs to be a separate audit. I said, no, it should be a component unit of this audit. I said, because if the citizens have to go look for the development authority audit, and they got to go look for the county audit, and then they got to go look for the health department audit, I said, it all needs to be into one audit. He said, well, you don't need to do it that way. And I said, well, explain that to me, because I said, the $15 million that the development authority put us on the hook for with the prior leadership of the prior administration on board with, who owes that money? He said, well, the citizens of Walker County. I said, so it needs to be on the Walker County audit. And we, all, we got pretty much in a pretty little discussion about this. And I said, look, you got two options. Either take the health department and make it a separate audit and bring me three separate <coughs> audits Health department, the county, and the authority are bring me one. It needs to be one. He said, well, I'll have to see if that's legal. Well, they come back two weeks later and said, you're right. We can do that. It's legal. So the development authority's numbers did get added into this as a separate component unit. So they're in here. Prior to 2016, it's not been on. Why I don't. If, if you approve that uh, 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 debt fee, yes, sir. Okay. Based on the different values uh, of the homes and stuff like that, have you, has there been a uh, calculation of how long it would take us? to uh, get out of the second million dollar debt based on how many of all the homes in Walker County were uh, I'm glad you asked. Fee. I'm glad you asked because I've done the numbers. If we kept a structure like this or something very similar to it, do the Dave Ramsey approach, pay minimums of everything else, snowball any extra that we've got, we would save $9.2 million in interest we could be 100% debt-free county in 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. So here's the thing. Let me give you that little story. When I was on the Chickamauga City Council three years ago, they had a proposal come to us to expand our water system, make some upgrades, get some low-interest loan money, get it all packaged up, all, all feeling good, raise our water rates just a little bit. We could pay that over 30 years. Well, I'm sitting there at the table at that time, I think I was about 45 or 46 years old. And I'm looking down the council desk, and I'm thinking, everybody down that way is older than me. By 20 years. One guy on this side is probably 10 years younger than me. So I spoke up. 
I said, guys, think about what we're doing here. I said, am I going to be sitting on my porch 30 years from now, 75, 76 years old with my wife, and go, honey, guess what just happened today? You know that 30-year loan we put in place for the water company? They paid it off today. I said, all you guys are going to be dead. I said, why are we going to keep this can to the second and third generation? I say generation is 10 years. Every 10 years is a new generation. So why are we going to pass this 30-year debt to our great-grandkids, your great-great-grandkids? Same thing with 70 million. I've got a six-year-old little boy at home that we've got full custody of. I don't want to, this thing now, if we leave it like it is, even with this Erlanger fix, but with all this other, we're 20 plus years. I don't want him to be 26 years old and say, Dad, I got a bill in the mail today. How do I, where did we get all these taxes? How did we get all that debt? Wasn't you commissioner? Because he loves to ask questions. He said, wasn't you commissioner? Did you create any of this? Am I paying for something you did 20 years ago? I'd rather be in a position and say, no, oh, son, I didn't have anything to do with that. $70 million I inherited, we paid it off in 10 years. So before you got out of high school, it was paid. So, it would be great if this county would get behind me. Number one, pass the teeth splash in November. Number two, realize that if we pay, do something very similar to this, we can put it on there and take it off in three years. If that's all everybody's got the stomach for, three years, we'll pull it off. I'll even put it in writing this week. Make it part of the minutes of the county. Or, if we let it go for 10 years, we can get all debt paid and have a county that's debt free and be one of the few in this state that would be debt free. Yes, sir. Since you're not for sure of what you're going to do, do you decide what you're going to do? Did you have to set up for three more meetings? No. I can take a fee and add it on the bill with just by uh, having it at a public meeting, which I meet the second, fourth Thursday of every month. So I put it on the agenda, 24 hour notice, I can sign it and roll forward. But what I've done to be transparent and to open with people is we've talked about this at some level in every meeting we've had thus far. So when, when, how will we deal with our budget decision? Good question. Joe, will you pull up our website? All of the meetings, it's something we've done new this year, it's never been done before. We set up a YouTube channel for the county government. Joe's gonna pull up here. You can go to our county website. All of my meetings all year, all the agenda packets, all the attachments, all the detail are on our website. So you can go to walkerga.us, go to the government tab. So this is our main website. Go to the government tab, slide down there to uh, public meetings. And once it loads up, it's right here. This is the YouTube channel that's kind of embedded or you can go directly to it. Here's all, here's the most recent, so you can pull up the agenda pack, you can watch the videos, all the way back to the first year. I had uh, one meeting that I had to cancel due to a scheduling conflict, I've got one coming up in October that's got a scheduling conflict, we know I've got to go to some mandatory state training conflicts in October. All my meetings are right here. And you can watch all those videos, or you're more than welcome to attend the second, fourth Thursday at the commissioner's office at 6.30. That's, that's a point. If you're talking about even that with property taxes, people say figure out a way because renters don't pay anything. I had a high school teacher of mine stop me in my yard when I was in high school, he stopped me in my yard two weeks ago. He said, are you going up on property taxes? I said, yes. He says, well, good. I've got two places fixing to put up for rent. Tenants just moved out. I'm going to go up on their rent to cover these increased property taxes. So people that do rent or people that own these government program-type homes, 
they all pay property taxes, so it's built into the rent or either the landlord's paying it or some of both. Some of the houses I've brought up have low income or we're paying funded programs. Right. Funded programs. Right. right. You got an example up here in Rock Springs, a new uh, y'all know where the new Dollar General was built? Is that Kate Conley? Yes. If you turn right there and head back east, there's a brand new apartment complex on the right. It's beautiful. That's a government subsidized housing unit. You pay based off of your income level and then the federal government subsidizes that. The people that own that property are paying the full load, no exceptions, no abatements, no exemptions. They're paying the full load of that. Now, you do have a federal housing program in Lafette. That may be 100% government owned that probably would not fall under property taxes. But these were independent business leaders and investors go out and build these megaplexes. Those are paying the full load even though they're government subsidized. Yes, yes, it's part of their expense load. And the only ones that I know of in, in the whole county of Walker is they're in the city of Lafayette. If there's others, I'm not aware of them. So there is a small pocket. It's 300 units. In Lafayette, in the city. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't remember. I know this was talked about in the news and in the paper. But how come we're the only county that owes our anger? Yes, they, Katusa, is not involved. Katusa's already paid for it. They also owed $8.7 million. So it started out at $10 million. They sold the nursing home and some other assets and got a credit from Erlang. So Walker and Katusa both owed $8.7 million. $5,000. So, so Katusa says, we're not going to fight you in court. What will you settle for? So Erlanger agreed to accept in settlement like $6.25 million back a year ago, July a year ago. And they settled. They're done. Katusa County wrote them a check. Pulled the money out of reserves. They wrote them a check. Dade County was the smartest bunch out of all of them. They said from day one, we're not going on the hook. We're not signing the note. We're not co-signing. You're on your own. So Walker and Katusa did the deal. And I think Dead County even gave up a board seat over that, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least it was talked about. So they stayed completely clean. They're the smart, they're our smart farmer friends. Um, and I've told them how smart they are. But uh, Walker County owes 8.7 plus taxes and fees, so we're about up to about 9.4 again. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a major, it's a major problem that's only going to get worse. Again, we're all in this together. we got to figure this out. And I've been, like I say, been losing sleep the last two weeks trying to figure out what's the right answer. Is it square footage? Is it property value? Or is it level for everybody? Do we make it as equitable as we can. We put minimums. Well, if so, what's the minimum number? What's the maximum number? I've got a spreadsheet with multiple columns with about seven different scenarios. And I sit there and I, and I go through it and I change it. And I get one a lot and I go home sleep on it and come back the next day and I tweak it on it. You know, I'm trying, because that, that's not necessarily final. That's just something I put together late last night to just show you something about what, what do we do. But I'd love to say, hey, I've got the money in the general funds, we're gonna cut a deal with them, we're gonna pay out the general funds, and we're all cool. I'd love to do it. But I still got another four million to cut out of the general fund. I think it's September the 9th is the next court hearing where they're going to move forward with enforcement action. If I get a way to pay it, I will go immediately to negotiate with them and or go before the judge and say, Judge, I've been trying to work this out. I just figured this out last week or whatever. Please give me some more time or force them to take my offer. You know, the judge, put the judge on the hot seat.
Well, a couple of things that's going to help us in our community. Some of you probably heard us talk about the resort development up in Canyon Ridge. That's still moving forward. That's going to be a $100 million plus mega resort destination. And they're projecting their annual sales to be over $22 million a year. We'll get the sales tax off of that. Hotel, motel tax, alcohol tax, all the properties around it will go up in value. But we're talking two and a half, three years out, which we need to be looking that far out. When you look at that project and all the tax load that it's going to bring, and you look at that like you would your retirement program, and you look 40 years out, that project will produce additional taxes to this county of over $78 million. We have a couple of manufacturers that are looking at Walker County. On a scale of 1 to 10, there's one that's about a 2 being the low side that has the interest of coming into our Rock Springs Industrial Park to create jobs, a foreign company. When you get the governor's office involved, you've got to be able to show that you're going to produce at least 500 jobs. That's part of the problem we've got. There's a lot of people have to go to Chattanooga or go to Whitfield County to go to work. We don't have enough local jobs. And so if you don't have local jobs and everybody's leaving the county or a good portion to go to work, then you don't have the retail to support it. So it's kind of the catch-22 or the chicken or the egg, which comes first. We've got one manufacturer that we've been working with, had another meeting with them last week. You know, you never know what for sure what's going to happen, but on a scale of 1 to 10, I put them at about an 8. Get the governor's office again involved, you've got to be 500 plus. The governor's office has been at the meeting, they're at the table. So it's a, it's a big opportunity for us that would be a lot of positive manufacturing growth for us if we can land this. They already told us they've got to be in production by January 2021. It takes them two years to do their build out. They've got to make a decision before the end of this year because they've got to be under construction by first quarter of next year. So if that one happens for us, we'll know before the end of this year if we're going to get that one. They say we're in the top of the top. Neither. I know that's a vague answer, but that's all I can say. It would be a fantastic opportunity for us. What other questions? The uh, business you got, you're talking about there, you said Rock Springs Industrial Park. Uh, you're talking about kind of where uh, the uh, break place is? Yes, Neeson Break, yeah. There's still some more parcels there, <clears throat> and that's one foreign company is, is looking at taking a pretty good slice of what's left. Is there uh, anybody looking at the uh, Rock County Industrial Park or not seriously. We've had some people contact us, and when they start looking at all their other factors and other opportunities, it's pretty cold right now. One thing that has been kind of unique, Stephen Henry, the commission chairman from Catoosa County, bought the Peerless Mill in Rossville. He's trying to work, get a plan in place to redevelop that. The county took a donation a few years ago of the old standard Kutcher Thatcher plant up there, which is in bad, bad condition. It's just sitting there deteriorating. The county's owned that, I think, since about 2006 or so. It's just sitting there. They've tried multiple times to sell it, almost give it away. We have four companies right now all in the hunt to see who can buy it first. Because with the change and everything's going on, they're going, wait a minute, if they're going to do that across the side road, we can do something with this building. So we've had four companies approach us about buying that building. It's been sitting there for years now, we've got four. What about the uh, uh, over uh, we're, they're, they're, they're storing Volkswagens over there. So they got Volkswagens at the old Bluebird plant. I think there's 6,000 at the old Barber plant down there on 341. So they're paying rent down there to the property owner. We, we didn't have any direct involvement. We just connected the 
sourcing company that was going to move the cars to the property owners and say, here, here's who you need to talk to. And they very quickly put a lease deal together to rent the, the 30 acres or so down there. Took up all the topsoil and put gravel down. So uh, I think they've got like a 13 month lease or something on the ground. I really do appreciate all y'all coming today. I've had people ask me, what can we do to help? Spread the word. Help me get the word out. The best way to get the word out is word of mouth. And if you want to put that on steroids, go to social media. Because we can touch a lot of people really fast. We do have one more meeting tomorrow night. Also, I'll be on TV again tonight. I do a TV show every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock on the Judy O'Neill UCTV 265. For those of you that don't get cable, if you have Facebook, they do a Facebook Live every week. You can watch it on Facebook, or they, you can stream it on their website, which is sporadic in quality, third-party company. But the Facebook streaming is pretty good. But typically, every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, I'm on there for an hour, take phone calls, unscreen, big target. But most weeks are a lot of fun. So tune in tonight at 8 o'clock. We have our next public meeting Thursday night this week, 6.30 at the commissioner's meeting, office. And it will be a, an abbreviated version of this, unless we just get a lot of questions and things. We're not going to have a three-hour meeting there, hopefully, being that late. So by state law, we're required to have three public meetings on a millage increase. I've had five. This is number four. I went over and above to give people an opportunity to come and participate. We've had great participation. Appreciate you coming. I'll be around a few more minutes if you have any more questions or comments. But I cannot thank you enough for being here today. And thank you for being a part of what makes Walker County great. Thank you.